Hi hey everyone, welcome to Talking Landscape Photography for tonight. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic to have you all with us. Uh, and um, we're very, very much looking forward to speaking with our guest tonight, Ben Mays, who's a really good mate of mine and um, a very, very passionate up and coming landscape photographer. And um, I'm sure you'll love his work. And also we'll go through all of his inspirations um, and sort of give a bit of an idea of the kind of work that's inspiring the younger generations coming through. And then maybe a few little um, uh, other photographers that might be worth following as well that are sort of coming up through the ranks uh, and that kind of thing. So very cool show tonight. We're always sort of wanting to have a bit of a youth kind of episode, I suppose, and then honouring, you know, some of the, you know, the the people that are trying really hard, trying to break in and and um, get a build a profile. So um, so certainly great to be able to cover that aspect of things. Paulie, how you been going, mate? Well, I've been busy growing my beard, mate. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been bush, um, riding, adventuring, shooting, surfing for the last nine days. Sorry to rub it in everyone. But uh, I did some really beautiful shooting in the in the northeast of Tassie, which is a bit of a, I wouldn't say it's a hidden gem, but it's a bit off the radar and, and there's not many people that know it very well. And particularly the rainforested areas that, and, and we had these crazy sort of rain events in the last week that are just pumping up all the waterfalls and the forest looked so lush and we had sort of low winds for a lot of that time as well so it was a pretty good opportunity to go there and um i literally woke up yesterday morning about fires shooting shooting there for dawn and which is always a classic uh i was considering not ever coming home but i just got an invitation to go um shooting and sailing around the southern end of the great barrier reef literally in about 36 hours so i'm sort of like desperately considering doing that uh i was just rushing and ringing up all the COVID hotlines to see if i'm gonna get caught out um i've been eyeing up uh Lucky, Lucky reminded me of a of a certain announcement that looks like might be coming up i'll let luke talk about that this guy oh, that's all right excited. might as well unless you've got other things paulus oh no i'm a bit, a bit excited about that one. Oh, smoothies that looks good not too bad um yeah so in terms of um what, what looks like it's happening is the new um, Mavic 3 release. There's quite a lot of um, leaks coming through. Um, for anyone that's into drones, um, it's a pretty big deal because the Mavic Pro series is probably the, well, it's the most kind of uh, highest quality, um, I guess, maybe mid-range drone you can get. Um, it's certainly a lot more professional drones like the Inspire, but the Mavic, the footprint of the Mavic versus the Inspire or something like that's considerably different. And Mavic's very, very portable and probably for, you know, content creators is, is a very, very uh, popular drone. So to have the, the third version come out, um, I think it's going to be quite a big deal. Uh, and what are they saying? November at this point for the rumours, but, um, you know, they're just rumours. Anything can happen there. Uh, but um, if you, yeah, if you maybe go on YouTube or something like that, you'll you'll be able to find a few of the um, leaked images, which seem to look pretty um, pretty convincing. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a um, big flight increase in flight time, up to forty six minutes. Um, you know, being able to charge the battery using a USB C port um, rather than having to use an external charger. Uh, and a double camera with one with a zoom lens, one with a standard wide angle. The wide angle is actually slightly wider than the Mavic. Um, now it's a, looking at it being a rather than a half inch sensor, a three quarter inch sensor. So quite a bit of a bigger sensor as well. So um, should be quite a, yeah, quite a powerhouse, I think. So yeah, looking forward to that. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, I heard some interesting rumors about battery life being extended considerably, but I'll, yeah. uh, I'll wait till the jury's out on that one. Yeah, no, it's just interesting to hear the talk about it. It's definitely due. So um, yeah, anyone that's into drones, um, yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. Anyone looking in to get into drones, it's probably going to be a great one to look at too as a first drone. So um, yes, yes. And also rumours about the A7 IV Sony um, camera um, possibly being um, announced soon. Um, all rumours, but um, very well due as well. So a um, few things... Um, happening uh coming up potentially so that's been interesting yeah i gotta i gotta wait Lucky. there's your four-year turnaround on most of the canon bodies so <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, another three right. years to wait well it's probably not a next? bad thing given how expensive well, they sorry, are sorry the r3 is coming on the way but it's it's probably 
probably not quite my weapon of choice um, for what I do to, for versatility. It's it doesn't have the res resolution that I like to have in my landscape work. But it's very curious about this eye control autofocus and how, how well it's going to come out. Well, that I mean, R5, I mean, that's all you really need, isn't it? I mean, you wouldn't need – that's pretty much – Oh, yeah, everything so happy you, with that. Yeah. Best camera I've ever used in terms of versatility. I um, actually forgot I mentioned it to Lukey. I, I'd spent about three hours today hunting old RAW files of 17 different drives for um, – I got 12 images um, asked for RAW verification in the new uh, Natural Landscape Awards. Um I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's it's a very new one. Um, Max, Matt Payne is one of the adjudicators who we had on the show just recently. And it's largely been pushed by a lot of the British photographers like Alex Nail and Tim Parkin and those kind of legends to create a, not necessarily a purist sort of competition, but one that really thoroughly puts camera craft front and forward in, in terms of competition status, which is... Probably, I wonder, it's kind of a little bit lacking in, in modern contests. Some of them don't have a lot of jurisdiction around that. It's all open slather and there's been a lot of, well, some conjecture that, you know, how do you how do you win some of these competitions with super high-end composite, you know, fantasy sort of like landscapes, which seems to be sweeping the pool quite a lot. And, and they do look pretty amazing. But, you know, if you compare the raw files of, of what's there relative to what you see on the screen, there's going to be a, a, a very a, quite a few dotted lines between the two, and it's nice to see um, a larger competition get off the ground. And that's part of the reason I entered just to just to really um, support them. And and it's you know I'm a pretty straight shooter as as Lukey knows, and I'd say 99 percent of what my work is non composite. Um, I don't even do focus blending. I never even tried it. I don't think um, you don't really get out of Lightroom too much, isn't that right? No, no, I just, oh, you know, I like the photos do the talking. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not close to the idea, and and I certainly, as a as a judge over the last twelve years, I've really had to learn to appreciate the the vision and, and the craft of and the creativity behind a lot of that work. And you know, even in a group like the Light Collective, um, I'm the straight shooter in the group, and those four guys are some of the best composite shooters in this part of the world. Um, and you know, I've learned to really enjoy and appreciate where they're coming from and and why they to approach things the way they do so i'm interested you know as we get more into introducing ben you know having a little bit of more of a conversation about where the younger generation is heading you know i grew up in film days and i've done the large slow chunky transition to digital which is dragging my feet at the beginning and, and sort of now i wouldn't go back but i've still got my old uh film gear getting gathering dust in the in the cupboard there ben but but i'm um, yeah I, i'm quite really excited for tonight and and mm. Ben's definitely one of those people that's very proactive and, he, and he's very engaged and he's on top of a lot of platforms and he's doing really progressive work already at a very young age. We leave it up to him whether he wants to say how old he is or not. No, oh, we're really, the cat's out of the bag on that one. I put that in the show notes already. Oh, did but, you? Okay. Yeah. But um, <laughs> just in terms of what I've been up to, um, well, I haven't done too much lately, but um, the, in Tassie this week, there's actually, or well, not this week, this, this time of year, the um, tulips start to flower the, world's um well, southern hemisphere's largest tulip field um around cape table cape in the vineyard is starting to flower so hoping to head up there on the weekend and, and shoot some astrophotography and possibly aurora if it decides to show up um around that time as well so that should be quite a bit of fun um yeah so yeah, spring's okay. definitely sprung down here so a lot of wildflowers and things going so um and i guess the hiking season's starting up so it's about time to plan for um doing a few hikes around the place and um yeah it should be pretty you know jam-packed few months ahead which is good i first uh, i first heard of ben partly with the roars and, and through luke and that uh uh, Luke was telling me about, oh, do you want to come join us on some trip up the East Coast? And I was thinking about it. And then he changed tack pretty quickly and, and went down with Ben to the South Coast and they managed to get a freaking Aurora oh, yeah, Astro Bio, something craziness all together at the same time. And, yeah. and I just you couldn't plan for that. Well, I mean, we I heard about actually. It. I said you couldn't plan for that, but we um remember Ben, we were like toing and froing for ages trying to look at the forecast. And I think we even yeah. didn't intend to go down there initially. Um, and I'm sure you'll yeah. pull up a few of the shots um later on from from that that mm. trip. But yeah, it's mm. yeah, it's funny when you say you couldn't have planned for that to happen, and but we actually kind of did. So that was <laughs> I don't think that we knew about the bioluminescence, so that was a bit of a an extra um little um there cherry on the top, but um yeah it was an amazing trip yeah so yeah certainly um keen to hear more about um that and and um all of the things um 
you've got to show for for uh, us tonight. Um, I guess we might as well, um, you know, kick it off and um, you know get yourself to introduce yourself, or, or you know how you know how long have you been actually shooting for, and and um, you know what is it about landscape photography that that it, you know makes you so passionate? Um, well, I've really been. I mean, I've been into like art stuff my whole life, like drawing and painting, like when I was a little kid was always my thing. Um, I think when I was like eight years old, I wanted to be a book illustrator or something like that. Um, but then, yeah, I think in about year, when I was in year eight or the end of year seven, even um, I picked up my dad's old Nikon uh, D70, which was like a six megapixel kind of super old DSLR and um, just started playing around with that and just fell in love with it um, pretty much straight away. So um, that just became my new creative outlet that um, I just got stuck into. Went through the classic kind of steel wool spinning in the backyard, kind of long exposure things, uh, car long exposure, to trails, all that. Um, the HDR sort of editing oh, phase. Yeah, everyone has thing. the phases. Everyone, everyone goes through that. The, yeah. the, when, you, when you discover the clarity slider, it's the best and oh. worst day of your life. <laughs> and I guess, too, um, I mean, you know, um, I, I wrote in the in the show notes as well, but, I mean, you, you've been shooting for many, many years. And, and so, like, mm. you were even would have been shooting and, and starting off in some of the times when, when some of those things were more popular, like HDR and that kind of thing. So mm. you would have also seen things kind of transition over that time too so um yeah i guess that's also kind of a cool thing um nowadays is um the younger generations i suppose um growing up you're able to actually you know um grow up with a dslr in your hands which um which was something that i kind of always wish i was able to do because um I, you know, film for me was always quite a challenging thing to, you know, have to pay for and, and look after mm. and, and manage. But, you know, growing up learning on a DSLR must have been quite a, quite a, 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 a good experience in terms of the feedback and things like that. Can you talk a mm. bit about that? I guess you probably don't know any other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all I know. Um, I think I shot one roll of film in my entire life. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's all I know. And it's, I guess when you've got, you know, just as much storage as SD cards as you want and all of that, you can see instantly the result. Um, the real only element to play with is your own creativity and ability. So, um, yeah, having less of a restriction with that's really good to have. Um, so, yeah, I got my first camera uh, when I was like, I think, end of 2014. Uh, I was an old Nikon D5200 that served me faithfully for the next five years or so. Yeah. Um split it with my parents um and yeah I, so my grandparents live up in the blue mountains um so we usually visit them twice a year at the minimum um so i was already before i got into photography you know going on waterfall hikes and all that kind of stuff with my grandparents um and so i was already kind of enjoying nature in that way um and we'd often go camping and road tripping as holidays rather than you know cruise shipping or whatever like mostly because we couldn't afford it but also yeah that's just what our family enjoyed um do you think and that's so, um, a, a massive part of why you got into landscape in terms of your upbringing got you mm -hmm. out into the outdoors and and really gave you yep. that appreciation yeah for sure, I think so. Like, I mean, I think, you know, if I'd grown up in the city and that was all I knew, then I would have gotten into city photography. Mm. Um, it's uh, kind of nature or nurture kind of thing. Mm. Um, and, yeah, and then in 2015, my family went on holidays to both Tassie and New Zealand. And New Zealand was our first overseas trip we ever went on. And, um, yeah, seeing proper, like, snow-capped mountains for the first time was just a mind-blowing experience. And, um, yeah, that was when I really just sort of, hit the ground running with landscapes and just got super passionate about it. Um, Can you think of a, a, a sort of a, was there sort of like an aha moment or something like that when you were just kind of, you know, made a decision to yourself or do you think it was a bit more of a slow burn and you just sort of gradually got more and more into it? Yeah, I think I just, yeah, just developed a passion for it over about the course of about 12 months um, from, yeah, when I sort of got my camera first and in 2014 to end of 2015 um and yeah experiencing you know the blue mountains and um tassie in new zealand was just fit a really good way to kick that off mm, um no doubt there's some pretty good yeah, spots right yeah. there yeah yeah kick started there mate yeah yeah for sure and then i'd like instagram as well was a big um 
a big motivator for me. Like a lot of people really struggle with Instagram as, and I know for some people it's um, like a demotivator, but for me, like to this day, it still gives me so much inspiration to see the work that a lot of people put out there. Um, and the only, th- the only thing I struggle with it is the time. Um, in terms of, you know, in consuming other people's work, I've done it just nonstop for five, six years now and just appreciating and analysing um, what makes a photo work and following, you know, those whose work I really admire um, has really like I've always been striving towards that in my, you know, the final result of my photos. Um, and so, yeah, I think as long as, you know, as photographers, we can always be learning something new and pushing our craft. We're never the smartest person in the room. We should never um, be the best in the world at the craft. There's always something we can learn that's new and um, be pushing ourselves. So that's a I know that's just what I've been doing for the last five or six years. Yeah. Say, I've always thought, again, you know, the something minute you stop learning the is the minute that you, um, you know, you should really hang the camera up. You know, it's, it's um, you know, it's mm-hmm. all about learning and, and developing and, and that's part of the journey and that's what makes it so challenging and fun. Yeah, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I just felt the hint of wisdom in that comment, but I didn't quite get it. Something about I was just um, like not being the smartest person in the room. Like I know if you're like if I'm trying to organize a trip with someone, I'll organize a trip with someone that I don't feel like like that. I feel like I can learn from. You know, um, I want to be able to be pushing myself and have others push me uh, rather than. I don't know, going with someone who knows less about photography to feed my ego and feel like I'm doing a great job all the time. Um, Because, yeah, I think ego is a very silly thing to have in the art world. And if we manage to make, you know, a career out of what we love doing, then we're very, very lucky. So um, that's, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there and I'd love to get there eventually. Um, And that's only going to happen if I keep pushing myself. So it's definitely yeah. also a great observation around ego and and um you know keeping that in check and and staying yeah. humble and and having that more beginner's mind and and really mm. being able to you know i still will listen to things or, or go to things that you know i, I almost probably know beforehand that i would know but um you always get those little nuggets and different perspectives out of it isn't it so it's definitely good cool yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I know I've just, um, I think well, once I left high school as well, uh, cause, uh, as like a high school, I, you know, I didn't have my own car or anything like that. Um, and so I couldn't, I don't like, I remember when I first got to shoot cathedral rocks, um, cause I'd seen it on Instagram for like three years mm. and, um, hadn't been able like, cause you know, up until I was about 17, 18, I couldn't, I had to get my parents to drive me to sunrise cause I didn't have a license. Um, and so, oh, I yeah, once I could actually, yeah, <laughs> um, took a lot of convincing. So, <laughs> um, yeah, once I could, I, th- I just kind of exploded with, uh, photography energy in 2019 because I just had it all pent up through the high school years where I, you know, had to dedicate so much time to school and everything. Um, and so I created a lot. Away. Goodness me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, and I mean, now, school man. was good. Yeah. And so I just kind of like, I captured, you know, most of my portfolio in 2019 because I was just, I like even when I had fifteen dollars to my name without a job, I'd spend that on petrol to go shoot the sunrise. You know, like it was, um, yeah. There was a point at, in that year where just nothing was stopping me from taking photos if the conditions were good. Um, I was working full time at a like a printing place um, at one point in twenty nineteen, and there was just a week of, of high cloud sunrises. And um, I drove down to Kiama for sunrise three out of five mornings that week and wow, then came back at nine o'clock right. and worked a nine and eight 30 till six job um, for the rest of the week. And uh, yeah, that's a two and a half hour drive yeah. or something down there, isn't it? From Sydney. Oh, from three. where I am. I'm South. I'm South. Sydney, oh, it's, so it's not about, so bad yet. But yeah. It's about hour 20 for me. Okay, um, That's pretty handy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was just had so much, I kind of just exploded with, you know, passion to get out there and, um, like I messaged Luke at the start of the year and you, Luke, and we had our trip in September, which is still one of the best weeks of photography I've had oh, in my it was, life. It was pretty, um, I was pretty chuffed yeah. with it myself. <laughs> it was fantastic. We can probably yeah. talk a bit more about that when we go through the photos as well, but um, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely, um, I was, yeah, it was a real, 
Um, it's a real shame. I think we've tried twice for you to come back down and, and do another trip and, and COVID's got in the yeah. way. So hopefully that yeah. finally um, gets through next year. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. How are you even handling that that gap? You know, we haven't been able to apply yourself in a tangible kind of physical way. I, I, it seems like you've been pretty active on online and different things instead. How, how have you sort of been yeah. coping with that time away from actually physically taking photographs? What, what have you been doing instead? Yeah, I struggled with it because um, uh, in December, I was, or January of this year, I was meant to go down with Luke and then there was an outbreak like two weeks before that, so I got cancelled. And then there was about a six-month clean period where I could have gone down. And then two weeks before our July trip that we'd planned, an outbreak happened again. And then this lockdown has lasted three months. So it was just terrible timing. So I was a bit frustrated with that for a while and had a lot of just kind of pent up, you know, exploration energy, I guess. Like I just wanted to get out there and shoot and um so yeah, I struggled with that for a bit, but I had um, I just kind of launched myself into a few different projects um, to keep myself busy. Um, so yeah, started getting into kind of NFTs. It's a bit of a hot topic, and don't, <laughs> don't have to spend too much time on that because uh, there's lots of different opinions on them. Um, uh, but that that was like kind of first thing I helped busy myself with. Um, I had very little to do. I pretty much lost all my work due to the lockdown because. Um, during the week, I'm a real estate photographer and um, most of my work is out of my LGA. So I was av- averaged about one a single job a week for about three months. And so I had a lot of home time um, and very little yeah, things to spend it on. So um, that became yeah, a bit of a blessing in disguise because I got to you know work on alternate um, sources of income that were actually through my landscape photography, which is what I'm more passionate about. And yeah. Um, you know, I built a new website just recently and launched that too. Um, I recorded my first tutorial, uh, Photoshop tutorial video, which I've been meaning to do for about 18 months now, but just never got around to finishing it properly or doing it properly. So I re-recorded that um, during the lockdown and learned um, Premiere Pro and all that and realized my computer is not up to scratch when it comes to video editing. And <laughs> um, well, Most computers are, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah i just kind of threw myself into a bunch of things which i'm really grateful for um and yeah it's while it was you know it was rough for a few months where this monday we should be um allowed to leave our lgas again um but yeah it was kind of a blessing in disguise in that i got to yeah start to work work on things and projects that i just when i was working um in the yeah, in a busy kind of schedule I just um, was too tired or didn't find the time to work on. So have you, yeah, have you, got, a, have you got a list, uh, your arm long um, to rebound out there? And shoot yeah. I was going to I was gonna ask a similar question, you know, what would be the first yeah. place you would go? Like that's a pretty telltale Ooh. in terms of what you're missing. Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, I expect New South Wales to open up before borders open up. So I'm guessing my first kind of places I can get to will be within New South Wales. Um, so there's a couple of little spots in uh, Kosciuszko National Park mm. that I'm really keen to get to. Um, yeah, there's a particular, yeah. That'd be amazing yeah. with the wildflowers as well. And I don't know if there's yeah. any snow left up there or sometimes I have a bit of late snow, but um, or at least some. Yeah, I've, I've actually only been to Kosciuszko in the middle of winter when it's packed in with snow. Um, so I'd love to see it when it's a bit kind of more got some grass and um, kind of tarns and stuff. Wildflowers are incredibly through. beautiful up there when it's, yeah, it's really like it's definitely worth mm-hmm. going in summer as well. It's um, very different feel, but yeah, certainly yeah. worth it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so probably Kosciuszko. Yeah. And, um, potentially uh kind of that barrington gloucester top sort of area because there's some really nice mossy rainforest in there mm. um i spent a week up in the mossy rainforests of um kind of like up along waterfall way uh up north like kind of dorigo and new england last year um and i, I realized recently i only came away with about four or five shots from seven days of being up there alone <laughs> but um yeah i just i froth on mossy forest so um really enjoyed that last year so might revisit there again at some point too mm, sounds really good um yeah yeah awesome yeah well it, there's a couple of great spots but kosciuszko yeah it really blew my mind up there so i think that's a pretty mm. good call heading in there awesome. yeah i remember um i remember seeing your moon halo shot uh, on the national geographic australian geographic yeah. calendar because my grandparents buy that every single year up the ones that live in katoomba and um 
yeah, like before we ever became mates, I remember seeing that in my uh, yeah. Yeah, grandparents' house. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, how how yeah. did you guys connect, Luke and Ben? Um, I think I just reached out to you at the start of yeah, 2019. Yeah, I, I was like, I was do you want to do a trip? I was already aware of Ben's work and all of that. And yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, I was already, I don't know if we we're already chatting or not, but um, I, I, I remember you had a series of shots to, from the labyrinth, um, which were mm. really, really pretty nice. And um, I, there's not too many um, people from the mainland come down and, and go to places like that to photograph, especially at night and things like that. So it really stood out mm. to me because it showed mm. a level of commitment and passion Um uh, and and the quality of the imagery um, was was you know that I could see that there was something going on there, so um, <laughs> certainly reminded me of what I used to do. Um, I, I you know about five or six years ago when I was doing a lot of hiking and visiting Tassie and, and doing that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think I was, you were very much on my radar if if um if you know um, we hadn't already been chatting, but yeah, it certainly was more about. Uh, been coming down and going for a, a trip and um and we'll see some of the shots no doubt from that um yeah, yeah but no, it's been been really great to follow his progress and also um see him he, he's very active at sharing the photographers that inspire him and so that was part of the idea of of this episode as well because um i've actually found um new photographers to follow through that and i think that's um um you know a bit of a um, and a lovely thing to do um, in terms of, you know, giving credit where credit's due like that. So um, having said that, maybe um, maybe it is a bit of time for you, a good time just to move on to that and, and for you to show us some of your inspirations. And and um, I, you, you actually have a page on your website even where you, we have some of those listed. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so when I, when I made my new website, I just pretty much dedicated a page to listing a whole bunch of photographers that have been um, most influential to me and my progress um, over the years. So, and there's a lot more that I, whose work I absolutely adore, who aren't on the list because, um, but yeah, this is it, list my, what I've with got danger up. when it comes to this sort of stuff, but it's still, <laughs> it's still very good that you did yeah. that because, um, mm. you know, it's, you need to have something on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get to sharing that. Let me, um, Share my screen. I'm inspired Alrighty. by Jan, Jan's background photograph. <laughs> okay. So um, I've got, so this is the kind of um, not comprehensive enough list that I've got here. Uh, yep. And it's got kind of. Um, well, lots of Americans. Yeah. It's, so I've, you know, growing up kind of with Insta Instagram is my main way of um, finding uh you know, fellow photographers to gain inspiration from naturally a lot of American and European photographers became that source of inspiration. Um, and so I've definitely kind of leaned towards that more, uh, that sort of style. Um, and so, yeah, the kind of big names are there like Alex Noriega and Ted Gore. I've got some of their websites up to show some examples. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's a, just a huge range of people that really inspire me from, you know, the, heavily processed and just super dramatic work of say Ted Gore um, from uh, this guy called, yeah, Mark Adamus. Um, he's, he's probably not as influential as these guys. So I kind of um, chucked him on the end there, but um, I know. And then, you know, this guy called James Watts, I might get his name up, his website up as well. He's mm. got some of the most fascinating um, intimate and abstract work that, you know, makes the most of midday light. Um, in just such an interesting way. And so does TJ Thorne, actually. His mm. photography these days is with, you know, double exposures and shooting direct, like in just midday sort of harsh light and making the most of that is really just fascinating. And um, like, I, I just study it and be like, how, how do you manage to take that shot and well, work with that sort of um, light? Yeah. So I'll get up the James Watts to start with because he's yep. just so different. Um, this is his work here oh, wow. and it's just absolutely fascinating. And I just like, you can tell that's just a completely flat overcast day, but it's just beautiful. And mm. um, you know, that's harsh light, harsh light, but it just looks, I, I just adore it. Very <laughs> it's hard to put into color words. Palettes, isn't it? I mean, there's... yeah, very, very natural sort of tones. Yeah. Um, so let me take a little while to load. Um, 
I know one thing. Um, but yeah. one thing that's um, I notice even with shooting with yourself as well is that you are very um, keen on the intimate style of landscape photography, where there's much more um, more about the detail or the picture within the picture. Mm. Um, can you yeah, describe absolutely. perhaps, you know, I mean, you do, and you take a, an amazing grand landscape too. So this is certainly not like, um, you can't do, you can't do the grand landscapes, but, um, yeah. you know, it, what's, what, what do you think it is that draws you to the more in, intimate style, like what we're looking at now? Um, I kind of got into it around maybe April, 2019 and, um, there's an Aussie photographer who now lives in London called Jacob Lewis, and he's only small and he's does like fancy science stuff as his career. But um, he's kind of like a um, had Eric Bennett as a bit of a mentor for a while, and um, yeah, like we, we were in Bermagui for four days, and we just started um, like he kind of opened my eyes, helped open my eyes to just shooting out, like making the most of you know a clear morning or sunny afternoon or cloudy day or whatever and just shooting textures and um shapes and lines that you know don't require a colorful sky um or anything like that and it's just once you open your eye up to that it takes a lot of fine tuning and just honing your eye into it um it took me months before i was you know i'd be able to quickly pick that sort of stuff up um but is that um, background yeah, I know. that you've got the show graphic, was that taken on South Cape Bay? Yeah, that was taken our first yeah. morning at um, I, Lion Rock. I remember yeah. walking in um, and you just saying, you, you, we saw the, the pebbly beach and you were just um, mm. completely frothing straight away. And, and <laughs> I was like, how did, you know, it's just not something that I would, um, you know, I would normally consider as a photograph um, because I'm, I'm probably more mm. of a grand landscape um, photographer. And actually mm. Alex Nail recently did a post on his personal um, landscape uh, Facebook page and was actually sort of indicating how there's almost like two different schools at the moment between grand and, and intimate landscapes, which was quite a fascinating conversation mm. in its own right. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, it was to me it was just a really um, good lesson or um, like me hanging out with someone like yourself um, to be mm. able to to see that detail and and um, and I, I think um, you know I was very excited about photographing with you uh, for that sort of um, inspiration in terms of the more intimate style of landscape. So um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely a, a different way of seeing the what's going on. Yeah, I just find you know it helps like it's so creatively satisfying. You can just find you know a little scene to yourself that's you know most people would walk over and if like figure out a way to compose that and make it your own, you know, one, a it's, it's pretty much impossible to comp stop. <laughs> mm. So it very much, it very much becomes your own yeah. work and very unique to you. And um, it's more of a challenge as well. So it just really is creatively satisfying to me when I can work with, you know, not this scene that's obviously presented to me and just work with the little details. And um, also it just makes you so much more productive because, you know, yeah. if you're only shooting with like 16 mil, 14 mil, um, and then you're relying on the skies looking good. So if mm. you've got either bluebird skies or overcast skies, then you're stuffed. Mm. Um, and so it just, I don't know, it helps me find things to be inspired by and sh shoot and take away portfolio images with, um, even when the conditions aren't absolutely stellar, which realistically we can't rely on um, because, you know, nature isn't always blessing us with amazing conditions. Mm. So, um, And I guess the other other side to it oh, i've lost my train of thought unfortunately um it might come to me but um yeah no let's um so yeah show us a bit more of james's work yeah i'm struggling to get his website oh, to, yeah yeah i love this one um i'm not sure if he's got a way for his website to show like a large gallery this is all i'm hmm. kind of finding even stuff like this like it's just so do you know where the location would have been for oh, I guess it's in Europe somewhere or um, um I think he I think he's American. Oh, okay, um, right. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah. Um my guess would be like for this sort of thing, probably the Utah sort of area. But um really that's yeah, just my guess. I don't think he's ever disclosed locations. So because it's really at that point it, it doesn't become about the location, it just becomes mm. about the subject. Well, that's very um, true, yeah. And I can see some mm. some sort of um, influence I'm either way. I know you've done um, was, um, a series of those sort of more intimate uh, rock 
uh, sandstone sort of uh, images as well. So I can certainly see that. Um, Playing with you know, shadows a lot. Yeah. Well. yeah. Um, I might even jump over to that. So like earlier this year during lockdown, when I, I could still um, get over into the National Park, the Royal National Park, um, I, could, I spent about two hours um, shooting and came away with about 29 photos, um, portfolio shots, which I turned into a gallery. And then I added a few more from my backlog. Um, so almost like about 95% of these were shot within the space of a couple of hours just in the mm. Royal National Park. Must have been a busy man. <laughs> um, just with like a, yeah, I was just, I just got into this flow state where I just, I was spotting things left, right and center. And I'd walked past this section several times and taken reference photos of my phone before as well. And so, um, cause I, I, there was a kind of, few months where I was really actively hiking this area and so it just kind of all uh, accumulated into this creative inspiration with the area where I just was spotting textures and lines left right and center um and so uh yeah I just kind of it's just these fascinating colors and textures in a sandstone that um, I really loved and there's a few it's others amazing area. from other outings yeah and um, um, with just from a technical perspective, um, I'm interested. You know, are they all very similar focal lengths and focus stacked and that kind of thing? Uh, most of these actually, because I went in without a tripod, so um, most were just handheld at a higher aperture. And um, so I, I'd been lent the uh, Nikon Z72 at the time, so the stabilization meant I could um, stop okay. down and handhold even when it wasn't as bright. Because um, oh, I think I was shooting it. Uh, a few times I was shooting at one eightieth of a second at 200 mil and um, was getting it sharp. So, wow. uh, yeah, so that was, that was really helpful as well. Just not having, and I had, um, what was the lens 24 to 200 or something like that. Okay. It's not a super sharp lens, um, but just being able to zoom, you know, something like this would probably maybe 35 mil or something okay. like that. And then other ones, you know, like that would be 200 mil. Um, that would be probably maybe 85. So just not having to swap lenses at all and mm. um, just being able to zoom in and out and just take a photo as soon as I saw it uh, really helps that creativity just keep flowing. That's very um, true because you're kind yeah. of moving through taking those images and so no wonder you could take so many in a short period of time. You weren't having the tripod there to kind of pull you up yep. each time which yeah. is, um, you know, someone like Will Patino is a very big advocate for being able mm. to move uh, freely through a scene without a tripod as well. So it's, uh, you know, yeah. done very well to, yeah. to so get... Yeah, these, like, they're not the most technically perfect sort of images. Yeah. yeah well, um, sorry, I was just saying, uh, like, yeah, they're not the most sort of technically perfect, like they could be sharper or stuff like that. But, um, you know, I've always had the opinion that, you know, having the image is more important than having a technically perfect image. Um and so if, you know, if sacrificing a little bit of sharpness because you stopped down more than the optimal kind of thing for the lens means that you actually came away with that photo because you didn't take the time to, you know, set up the tripod, focus, stack it, get a bit frustrated because it was all fussy and everything like that and lose that flow state. Um, you know, I'll, I'll always lean towards just making sure I actually have the photo. Yeah. So um, And it's also about yeah. what point is in focus as well. So, I mean, it, it's not always, sometimes it works better having a bit of a shallower depth of um, field as well. It's, it's more mm -hmm. about, yeah, what, what parts actually got the sharpness. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we do get a bit too worried about sharpness sometimes and mm. um, that's probably to, m means that you miss out on a lot of other things because you're focusing so much on stacking yeah. or, or those sort of aspects. So yeah, it's an interesting yeah. point of view. Yeah. Mm. And when I'm doing those wide angles, like with, um, you know, exposure blends and stuff, I'm very technical with that. Like, um, you know, there's lots of detail and elements that I'm wanting to get, uh, you know, nail the shot with, and, um, you know, I'm shooting a 14 mil and got a close element to the frame, then I'll focus stack and I'll do all of that. So I'm pretty but, sure um, you stacked the um, show graphic, didn't you? The, the scene behind you. Um, uh, actually, no, I think this was a single frame. I was a single as well. Here. Okay. Yeah. I think I was only had to shoot about F11, I think. And, um, cause it's all a pretty similar plane, those rocks. Yep. Um, I do have another one of these rocks though. Uh, let me, I can get it up that I had to do, I think a 10 shot focus stack. Oh, that might've been the one I was um, thinking of. I remember you yeah. saying how you had to, um, yeah, you had to kind of, um, give it a good go. <laughs> uh, let me 
you find it. This one was, I think, a four or five shot focus stack that was also at South Cape Bay. Oh, yeah. Um, on, on the same morning. Um, and this one. So this one here. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Once it loads. And you had to work with a polarizer or something as well. Something like that. Yeah. I had a polarizer to get. Oh, it's struggling to load. Let me just exit out of that. But this one here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I had a polarizer to shift where the glare was on the rocks uh, to make sure it, like it gave them a nice outline and had a nice play with that. And I think from yeah corner to corner, there was ten photos used for focus stacking um, to get shot because it's you know it's really on like a forty five degree angle yeah. kind of thing. Um, so uh, it's really and if the shot required the shot that I'm envisioning requires that heavy technique technical stuff then that's what I'll that's the effort that I'll go to um because you'd have to have an aperture of like f40 to get that in focus yeah. in one shot oh, so yeah and then um, you'd have all diffraction yeah. problems so yeah yeah no that's um kudos for putting the effort into stack it all <laughs> do you find that with a lot of yours or is it sort of a bit um like you'll stack it if you can but if you if you you know um if you're in a hurry or whatever then you know, you'll, you'll still just take it anyway, or like in terms yeah, of the pretty portfolio much. you've got there, they're mostly stacked or. Um, uh, I'd say probably most of my abstracts and stuff are not stacked. Yeah. Kind of like ones like ones like this and this, they will be stacked. Yeah. Um, this was actually on the Tarkine coast with you. That was midday sun on wet sand. Yeah. Um, I think that was a, that might've been a handheld focus stack actually of just two shots from there to there. Mm -hmm. um, can't quite remember. But then most of them will be like, you know, um, that single, 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 yep. single, single, um, single water ones. You don't need a focus stack. Um, yep. So, yeah, it, it just case by case, really. Yeah. So, um, yep. Fair yeah. Enough. Yeah. Awesome. Um, but I'll go back to kind of look at some other people's yeah. work. Um, so I've just, yeah, as like, as you saw with my um, inspiration kind of, section um there's a whole lot of names here that i really just can't go through so i've kind of got my main five that have really um acted as inspirations for me over yep. the last several years um so alex noriega is a big one and i know he inspires a ton of people yeah um, amazing he's just yeah got an incredible eye um and i'll see if he's got yeah personal favorites um just stuff like this and i think this one here Still blows my mind mm, to find me this too, kind of, actually. Definitely a I think this has got to be one of the best intimate shots ever taken. <laughs> so yeah. it's just to find a fern structure like that, perfectly framing a flower with, you know, these clovers with, you know, little water droplets and stuff and mm. just have such perfect balance. And then to just walk past that and spot that and frame it up so nicely is just, um, just incredible. Yeah. The three dimensionality um, of that um, is just, um, yeah, I'm seeing an actual print of that um, must be astounding. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he kind of moved from these wide angle scenes to uh, real, just pretty much entirely shooting intimates and excluding the sky um, over from kind of his earlier years to these days. Yeah. Um, so he's really um, his method of editing and then his eye for minimalistic intimate compositions are probably the main things that inspire me. Um, yeah. He's uh, good at making sure the shots aren't too harsh, but also not just overly flat, um, having the right amount of like a contrast and saturation boost, um, but just, yeah, showing form within the natural landscape. Mm. And he's also um, really, really um, um, good at post-processing too and knowing mm. what to, to, to do yeah. to get out the, the most out of the pictures. So mm, um, Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, but he won the... Um, uh, international landscape photographer of the year a, a few years ago mm. yeah yeah i think 2016 um yeah, yeah he, i think he went won a couple like oh, two or three in the same year which really um accelerated his career yeah um yeah no yeah. yeah i think that's even like what you're saying about 2019 it's very common for photographers to sort of have a bit of a purple patch and and everything just mm. sort of goes their way and they can just shoot and it's just all all flowing and but uh, unfortunately it's not normally like that all the time yeah, yeah we can't always expect that <laughs> i had a um, year i think it was 2015 for me was um was yeah. just insane and um yeah, yeah i'd love to get back to that <laughs> at some point yeah <laughs> yeah um and then I've kind of got three primary inspirations for my wide angle stuff. Um, again, there's much more still, but uh, 
Ted Gore being one of the main ones um, of his processing um, tutorials were, yeah, some of the, probably the most influential for my editing um, and kind of the artistic direction he takes his shots is often beyond what I'd take mine in. Uh, like he's yep. quite a liberal processor, um, but his application and vision of being able to execute that from the raw files that he has is just astounding. Um, mm. And then, you know, his eye for composition and, um, you know, being a bit of a crazy shot, but also not just, you know, making it ridiculous, you know, not going too crazy with saturation and contrast and stuff, keeping it reined in and tasteful, um, you know, like using color theory. Thanks for depth and um, points of interest. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's just really masterful. Um, so shots yeah. like this, this is just insane. And I'm pretty sure he pieced this together from several shots because he didn't have his composition set up when the light was going off. So he like got a frame of the mountains and then got all the other pieces and stitched them together in Photoshop. I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, just his 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 wide angle work. Um, it's very inspiring to me. Um, just yeah, the mood and atmosphere that he has. Is he um, very active at the moment? I haven't seen so much of his work lately. Yeah, I, he kind of. From what I know, he yeah, he works in the motion graphics industry. Um, so I think he got a bit of creative burnout and then gets a lot of his um, kind of creative, you know, dose with his actual day job. Right. Um, so he doesn't really need photography to do that. And he released a, like one or two new images recently and a few new tutorials recently. Okay. But yeah, a few years ago, around 2018, he kind of um, came to a bit of a halt. Um, I really enjoy going... the waterfall one at the bottom there. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Iloa. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, just that and even, foreground. Yeah. Yeah. And even just use of creative things like this, like just using a ripple bending around this rock here as a leading line is just crazy. And I'm pretty sure he was, he was saying his, um, like the lens hood of his 14 to 24 was dipped into the water at that oh. point. And he had to, had to like handheld focus stack it with like 10 shots and, just the, the dedication and creative eye to find stuff like that to make a photo work. Um, also, the, just, yeah. the um, exposure blending too, I'd imagine that the dynamic range mm. in a scene like that's unreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be pretty pretty difficult to manage. Uh, that, that shot reminds me of the Blue Mountains Canyons. Is that, um, you know, going up to the Blue Mountains a lot, is, is that something that you've, um, you know, look, thought about doing? Um, yeah, I've, you know, like your shots from there and um, uh, who else is, I can't remember the name. Um, Jake Anderson. Got some really, yeah, 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 Jake Anderson, I think. Um, and I think Florence Van Bu uh no, that's not his name. Um, There's a guy with a French name. I can't remember oh, his name. Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I can't remember yeah. his name, but I know who you mean, yeah. Um, yeah, got, got some great shots in those canyons. So I uh, know I've never, been, like, I'd like to do it eventually. Um, mm. Hadn't gotten to it yet. Um, I need to be. I imagine there's a lot of planning and logistics in that. Yeah, um, just either that or just go with the Blue Mountains Adventure Company or something like that. It's definitely well worth mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, Aaron Bubnik's another really fantastic um, photographer. So, yeah, she's another Californian American photographer and um, she's just got really masterful work and she's very. In terms of how many images she puts out, she's very quality over quantity, which is something mm. I tr kind of try and do as well. Like, I won't try and you know put out shots for the sake of putting out shots. Um, it's very hard to, to do that though, Ben, isn't it? Because um, if you're trying to build a profile on social media, um, like you kind of almost do need to, you know, um, produce content at a reasonable frequency just to kind of stay. I guess there's, there's two schools of thought. Either you release something that just blows people's mind every now and then, or you mm. release really good stuff on a consistent basis. Um, and mm. I guess, yeah, you're in that, that former category there. So yeah, it's just about making sure that people see it when it does come out, I guess. Yeah. 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 And like when I was younger, like, you know, kind of 2016, 2017, um, I was like, if I had one good sunrise, I'd, you know, force 10 shots out of it so I could have stuff for Instagram. Um, uh, but then I kind of developed a much a more minimalistic shooting style where I'd find, you know, a couple of compositions that I'm really happy with and just dedicate time to nailing them in. Um, and then, yeah, with 2019, because I was so active, I had a lot of good shots 
so I, I could put out quality, but also quite regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so these days, like, because I've barely been able to get out almost my entire Instagram feed is just reposts. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of how I stay active. Um, with free edits. <laughs> free I think, and, um, yeah, I personally think it's fine because, um, yeah. you know, if people are coming in and finding you, they, mm. they're not familiar with a lot of your older work. And if people yeah. love following you, then they'll, they're quite happy to see some of the older work as well. Cause that's what got them in to start with. So as long as you don't overdo sure. it. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, Aaron, Aaron's work is just uh, a really fantastic blend of just really clean compositions every, every, time is like that middle um, top one is that snow melt or something or ice this one here uh yeah the one below it with the sun the the colors yeah i was wondering the same thing yeah interesting the what the that, tessellations um, are I think it's yeah. the, the salt lakes uh yeah, salt so lake. i think it's okay yeah like a little my, salt my there. And, um, fairly, maybe. Yeah. yeah yeah oh wow so um yeah, she's very good with her foregrounds isn't she in terms of having is, leading yeah. lines in and um, very mm. subtle color palettes, but just you know, you know the the subtlety mm. is is um you know yeah. it's, it's, there's enough color there to hold your eye. Yeah, yeah. It seems like this, Americans are very good at mid tone contrast and and handling that really well. It seems to be a consistent mm. part of their style. Yeah, um, there's a particular one of hers that's just been a personal favorite of mine for years. I'll see if I can find the it. One with the purple to... flowers. No, not that one actually. <laughs> uh, that one, I like that one a lot. <laughs> yeah, she loves her purple. Oh, that's actually. the one there. Yeah, time. one of the June. Yeah. The back. yeah. Um, Mud cracks. Uh, yeah. This this one. This one. I love this one. Um, once it comes up, just the atmosphere mm. is just astounding. Um, like it looks out. You know, looks like it could be a composite. It's just mm. the use of this foreground as a frame to just this crazy cloud um, atmosphere and the mountain and just the touch of color in the background to make it not just monochromatic. Um, it's just fantastic. And she got a story with every photograph band by the looks. Uh, yeah. It looked like a, quite a caption with each one, which mm. is kind of lends itself to her quality over quantity kind of thing. And yeah. I think she'll release like, you know, eight photos a year kind of thing at the max. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of effort goes into each one and so each one's really just dialed down with processing and um composition and yeah there'll be a story with each one kind of thing so reminds me of um, some of grant dixon's work um poorly um and from like the southwest with the little figure in the cloud top yeah yeah i was gonna say it looks a bit tolkien-esque which is sort of new zealand has kind of style and mm -hmm. grant's quite famous for, for getting the tiny figures and, and the large mm -hmm. alpine landscapes in particular Certainly could do yeah. a show like that. And, and Max Reef in, uh, in Norway. Oh, yes. Yeah, some classics. Oh, there. yeah. Um, yeah, so her work's really fantastic as well. So those, so her and then also ooh, the Zoom thing's kind of blocking my tabs now. Um, <laughs> on Rico Fasadi as well. It's one of my probably, so being my third kind of main wide angle dramatic landscape inspiration. Um his work is just, you know, he's been a master for years of that dark processing style, mm. um, just that dark but detailed, you know, shadows and just ethereal sort of atmosphere. Um, I think, yeah, he's so unique and he's European? got you know, this copy. Sorry? European? Yeah, Italian. Italian yeah. yeah. So French Alps, um, Dolomites, and he loves the um, Canadian Rockies as well. So he's got like a Cine boy in here. Um but yeah, just he's he's also quite liberal with his processing. Uh, but he also pursues these kind of just super dramatic um, conditions um, and just yeah, some nails of the atmosphere in them. Some of it's um, some of the conditions there are probably not the conditions that a lot of photographers would be happy with either. So he's sort of yeah 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 it's, yeah it's quite, quite interesting stormy and dark. And... Yeah, um, and he like sights. Um, like Lord of the Rings is one of his biggest inspirations, which is pretty cool. Like, um, mm. you know, shots, yeah. photos like this one here, um, if it decides to load. Um, yeah, here we go. Like, that's just uh, huh. you know, straight out of a video game kind of thing. Isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, he's just really masterful, both with his, you know, dramatic processing and, um, yeah, just these ethereal compositions and chasing that. Keeping um, the detail in the atmosphere. shadows. Yeah, it's mm. really... It's a, 
it's a tricky tricky task to manage but he does it so well um on oh, the soft tones in his snow shots as well are just really satisfying like i love that one um so yeah yeah he handles and, his and then, um, low exposures beautifully hmm. um and then as a final kind of main inspiration is tj thorne um and he's very much for his uh his uh, intimate work um, and is some of the most creative kind of abstract work that I see um, his winter in the West collection. Although, you know, I haven't really had much of a chance to shoot in the winter, um, just beautiful minimalism um, like this shot here, uh, just so well balanced and dialed in. Um, it's kind of, um, like this X of bush in the foreground, these layers of trees and the layers behind it. Um, it's just hard to be a bit slow now. But yeah, he's, um, and then his newer work still is even more kind of abstract. Um, so he kind of, he's a big inspiration for the texture, explore, exploration of textures and rocks and lines and shapes and all that for me. Um, and then also, yeah, he's got this figments of place collection. Um, where yeah, it's very kind of like double exposure style um, and, you know, intentional camera movement. And um, like, I believe that's, that's that looks like it's deliberately out of focus, but it's, it's just works so well for creating this soft kind of look to it. Um, and I've got no oh, idea. That, that, creates... that white one, the center bottom left, I remember him saying that that's a single mm. exposure. Yeah. And I have no clue. <laughs> Absolutely. No uh, clue I looked at it, it and said, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. So, so this is um, the left. This one here. Yeah. Um, and like this one as well, the, just the beautiful colors. I'm guessing that's a double exposure, but it's just done so well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a very broad um, range of inspiration for me, um, which kind of, yeah, has generated this weird fusion sort of approach in my own portfolio where I've got, you know, 14 millimeter landscapes along with, you know, 200 millimeter focus stacked intimates and all that kind of thing um, that I think sort of actually cohesively works because I've been doing it for a while and it sort of has become my thing to do both um, that I'm like 50%, like 50% of my portfolio is one or the other. I think um, I remember I was going to say a bit earlier, you know, um, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of power in that because you can tell a really good story that way in terms of having a grand landscape that shows the full scene and then you can have the intimate shots that sort of give you some more of the detail. And, you know, if you put yeah. all of the shots that you would have got down at South Cape Bay, for example, together, you could tell a, quite an interesting story from all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And help people to understand. There's a lot more deep, a lot more there than just the big grand scene, which is probably probably the most obvious thing there. So, so that's um, definitely yeah. the power of the intimate shots for sure. Yeah, yeah. So certainly something that even Peter Dombrovskis um, did as well. He, he, you know, he mm. some of his more intimate shots are probably his more famous ones, but he's got some you know massive um, grand scenes as well that sort of you know it all works together to tell that story so it's a he's yep. definitely a master class in that for sure yeah and i absolutely adore peter's work as well like his um like yeah, i was studying his work uh a few weeks ago and was just just in awe um at like he's got a forest shot that reminds me of Enrico Fassati's you know work um just this gnarled mossy tarkine forest um tree and it's just the the atmosphere and the detail in his compositions just fantastic. And yeah, he was doing it for decades before you know any of us started doing it. So um, I'm a huge admirer of um, you know the older film masters as well, especially you know an Australian like Peter. Uh, he's got he was just a master of composition. And, Have you um, ever gone through yeah. the um, National Library um, page where you can actually see all of the scans that over over the course of his work? It's, it's definitely something good um, if you're looking for inspiration mm. in terms of Peter yep. Dombrowski's work because it, it even shows you um, that he took three or four shots of the same scene so you can almost see how he's changed his composition or waited for different light and that sort of thing. So it's um, yeah, right. it's really quite, quite. I mean, you, you're going to lose quite a few hours doing that, but um, yeah. I definitely yeah. recommend it. And it's the, I think it's the Trove or something they call it. Um, yeah, and, okay. um, yeah, definitely recommend it. It's really um 
and there's a lot of really great shots in there too that that haven't really seen you know the full light of day as such as well so yeah it's really good mm. yeah yeah i'll have to check that out sometime yeah awesome and then you've got a few um, other photographers that you kind of um more from an up and coming perspective or other other guys you've sort of been keeping an eye on uh yeah so i've i've got a few kind of small portfolios of um some aussie guys that are up and coming as well um that yeah i can kind of consider peers um some are you know pursuing it kind of uh semi full time or are just you know hobbyists but i just you know i really enjoy their work as well um or or i shoot alongside them and consider them mates so uh what have i got here some you know sometimes that's the way people start as well i know i, I sort of started as a hobbyist personally um and how i got into it so um you never know where these guys might end up yeah 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 so um lyle I'm, yeah i'm pretty sure he's just a casual kind of shooter from victoria but he's just got some really fantastic work um he's nice and is like quite subtle with his edits, which I really appreciate, you know, being someone that still, I tend to lean towards a slightly heavier edit. Um, I, I really appreciate when people will do these more natural looking ones. Mm. Um, so let's go just all images here. Um, yeah. I've been yeah. really drawn to his work recently as well. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I've really, yeah. Really admire his um, yeah. Subtle processing, as you mentioned, and, and still quite mm. a lot of mood and, um, mm. well thought out compositions yeah uh, I think that was the Cosi Oscar one you mentioned yeah that's earlier. definitely um, it yeah mm. oh like beautiful transitions from blues to orange that's right yeah the yeah the hot cold yeah so um it's yeah he's just got some really great well. work and um although he's really only you know posting his stuff to Instagram you can tell that he doesn't care for you know feeding the Instagram algorithm with portrait colorful bangers and stuff mm. bang i hate the word me too <laughs> um, don't use it it's banned yeah. on this channel <laughs> yeah I, I, it's only yeah it's used to describe the context <laughs> not a well, fan i think um, that's why that's what that's the problem with the term because it's a banger yeah. is sort of just totally objectifying a photo and and you mm. know it's all about how you know how many likes you're going to get on it and all of that yeah. so yeah it's uh, how in your face it is to generate three extra seconds of attention on instagram kind of thing <laughs> yeah, so, so um well i wonder if that's yeah. had a big impact on younger photographers like they've they've almost learned potentially learned how to post process before they've learned camera craft and it's i, I absolutely it, think so yeah it's yeah. kind of the opposite from how we grew up in film days you learn camera craft and mm. There's not a lot of post processing yep. involved at all, really, except for maybe darkroom if you yep. get seriously into it. Yeah. And now, you know, like you, you can throw an Instagram filter on something instantly that would have taken mm. years to actually learn how to to do yourself and in, mm. in the background yep. or, or to shoot that way. So I, I was sort of yeah. curious, I think curious that def- you're showing a, yeah. a younger photographer who's kind of cutting away from that and and using the camera craft and, and really classic sort of minimal post processing style and let it let the images do the talking instead of the post work and i i wonder where the younger generation sits in terms of their influences in terms of um what they see as more more important in terms of a stylistic finish you know and i've heard you know i've heard you know photographers who are primarily on instagram they've said that they struggle to um shoot outside portrait orientation because they're so used to shooting in portrait because that's what is good for instagram mm. like that shooting for instagram has become their workflow in the field and that just kind of blew my mind because that was never a, a consideration for me um Either. and like it's yeah when i heard that from I've, I've heard it a couple of times and i was just like what like um like yeah, shooting for the four by five Instagram format is, you know, some people's approach to a composition. Um, and yeah, I think like, you know, every every image should be dictated by the scene before you, not um, by the social media platform that you're going to be posting it on. So um, yeah, it's really interesting to see how it shapes some people's approaches. And there are definitely people that are putting more effort into learning processing before mastering composition. So, um, and that's not to throw shade at anyone. That's just to like kind of look objectively at how um, Instagram and stuff has helped is shaping the next generation of photographers. So it's really refreshing when, you know, someone like Lyle and, um, 
you know, some of the other guys I've got here take a more subtle approach. That's interesting uh, too, because he hasn't doesn't look like he really sticks to any particular aspect ratio either. It's he's mm. probably mm. just cropping the images to um mm. to whatever works best for the image, um, which I'm always mm. I always um avoid doing. But um, I mean, it makes sense. But yeah, it's um that, that yeah. says a bit more too about you know it's all about the image and less about the thought process around the output. Yeah. Yeah. And um, actually, while I'm on Victorian photographers, let me get up. I mean, you've had Jeff on this website on on your thing before, but I can't go past you know. Oh yeah, Aussie, Aussie guys Great. without showing Jeff's yep. work. Um, yeah, he's very he's Jeff, kind of in the same vein as Lyle, and I suppose isn't he in, in the sense of the yeah. processing level and and but yeah, totally different. Yeah, beautifully subtle. Yeah, mm. and um, yeah, me me and Jeff had a fair bit. Um, you know, see each other like our shots for critique and stuff to bounce off each other's opinions. And um, yeah, like it's been amazing to see his art develop over the last few years because, um, you know, he, uh, yeah, just very quickly transitioned to really mastering these um, intimate compositions uh, after doing a little bit of wide angle work to start with and everything. And, you know, he's, yeah, like I, it took me years to get my eye in and, um, it's, so I, I get kind of like, oh man, I wish I progressed that quickly. When I see people like Jeff just start to nail it after maybe three years of um, doing it, so yeah, he, he's just got some really lovely processing and compositions, and just very effective um, in how he frames his shots. So mm. um, I think like this one here is one of my favorite shots of his because just the the way he's retained the luminosity but kept the shadows is just so impressive to me. As a, and it's you can tell that with that sort of light. Um, especially with Aussie kind of bush colors that would, wouldn't have looked great in color. That mm. uh, would have been very brown and kind of gray green with these, with this sort of foliage, but it just works so well as a black and white. So being able to envision that and process it as well as he, as well as he has here. Um, yeah. It's just really fantastic. So um, yeah, he's a, another great photographer. If people aren't familiar with his work, then definitely give him a follow um, on the re relevant platforms and check out his website, which is, I mean, with any photographer, you should like if you enjoy their work, you should, you should always you know browse their websites rather than just using Instagram because you know photos need to be appreciated bigger than what a two inch screen. Um, so yeah, I always recommend. Um, yeah, at least on Facebook or Twitter, you can kind of click on the image mm -hmm. and it you know can expand to quite a bit of a bigger size. But I don't know what yep. Twitter's max is, but yeah, on Instagram, mm -hmm. you kind of shoehorned into into the size you get yep. and that and especially if it's a landscape mm. image too you're really only looking mm. at a sub one megapixel image at the end of the day and they're probably captured yeah. in you know 30 to 50 yeah. megapixels so it's um yeah a bit sacrilegious really yeah yeah so um he's got a really nice clean website as well i wonder um, i wonder about how much you know the basically 90 nine percent of modern imagery is only ever going to be viewed on a screen which was never the case of my generation and i wonder yeah how that kind of influences you know the, the platforms that people use for shooting as well because they're not, not mm. necessarily needing the you know high, re high resolution outcome that we did in the past for for printing based you know like in the early days it photo didn't exist unless it was printed and it was shown by hand you know a lot of the time or or in folios that you carried around with you i've still got big folios upstairs of, of all the early film work and big prints was the only way to really share your work. And I'm a little yep. bit curious how that's shaped and will continue shaping things into the future, you know, moving away from the printed form into the purely mm. digital presentation because it doesn't require, you know, mm. the same kind of um, output intention. Mm. Mm. And I, I kind of see that like, you know, to bring NFTs back up again, um, I, I see that as the, progression that's caused that to blow up um love them or hate them uh like you know the increasingly uh digital way that we consume most things these days people are caring less and less about physical you know tangibility in a product whether that's worth spending money on or not and is that people um, or is that photographers that's my that's my question because I, I don't know how many actual yeah. punters are you know going to go and look at an nft or anything like that you know yeah, I mean, like we get in our own yeah. little echo chamber, being photographers, and think that it's only a, we're only making work for other photographers to look at. Yeah, yeah, Good question, Luke. yeah, and yeah, that's yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, definitely with the the younger generations, uh, 
it's more widespread amongst just consuming things digitally. And I mean, if you even just look at how we listen to music and stuff these days, you know, mm. 20 years ago it was CDs, it was vinyl. Um, these days, almost, you know, 99.9% of people are using Spotify or Apple Music to consume their uh, music and people see no less value in it not being tangible, it being a digital kind of way of doing that. It's um, it's about the convenience and ease of access. Um, and so I see... I think photography is almost late to the party in all, in terms of how you how it's sold really uh, with NFTs being an evolution of that. Um, uh, yeah, being moving away from you know physical prints being the only way that things are sold to you know this more digital um, way of consuming and buying and trading art. And um, I'm not you know in terms of being a collector, I, I don't think. It's I'd much prefer personally to buy, to buy a print or a book from someone. Um, but I think there's, yeah, always, there's going to be an increasing amount of people that place just as much value in digital assets that they are in physical, um, which I think is just a natural progression from yeah, the other way. Uh, digitalization of everything is taking over the world these days. Um, so, you, yeah, it's um, an interesting kind of. Do you find um, being involved with NFTs? Because um, I know you've doubled in it. Um, well, probably more than doubled. Sorry, mate. But um, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, I, you know. I've seen you've, you're sort of hesitant to talk about it in some ways. You know, do you feel like there is a bit um, getting involved in it where you know you, you kind of enjoy it, but part of you wonders if you know that's the best thing to be doing, or uh, you, you know, how do you, how do you describe that yeah. relationship? I don't know. I've just I've seen some quite a polarizing divide caused by them, um, which is really unfortunate because there's lots of nuance to the discussion, um, and there's been people within the community that within photography that have yeah just been very judgmental um, and bashing of other people that have explored it and. Um, you know, they do have their faults. There's, you know, environmental um, criticisms of it, which are very valid. Uh, but I think individual, when it comes to that argument, individual um, uh, carbon footprints need to be considered. And people have been, you know, making full-time incomes from selling out eight international photography tours for years, which would have a much larger carbon footprint. But I've never heard anyone protest that as a means for making income for the photography. And so, you know, to have this new thing kind of come in, um, which, you know, isn't ideal, but is moving towards a more green sort of way of doing it. Um, you know, people in the pandemic are struggling to earn their money. They might have lost, you know, lots of income from cancelled tours and stuff. Um, it's been kind of sad to see a lot of the bashing of photographers that have gone into it. Um, but that being said, yeah, it's not without its faults. Um, and, One thing I, uh, I tend to find with it um, is the sort of the hype around it or the back slapping or the kind of um, mm. it's almost like a, a, a cult or something like that in terms of just how, yeah. um, how like if you go on Twitter and see, you know, people, you know, it's, it's refreshing when you scroll through the feed and someone's just posted a photo for posting the photo's sake rather than posting yeah. their latest collection or, or something like that and then trying to sell things all the time. So, yeah, it certainly... kind of took over Twitter. And um, it, like I, about a month or so ago, I deliberately cut back on NFT posting because I was using Twitter pretty much exclusively for NFT promotion because most of the other platforms don't care about it. It's really mm. a Twitter bubble. Um, but at that point, I was, you know, I was getting sick of seeing it in my own feed and I didn't want to contribute to that as much. So, like, you know, if I have something go on sale, then I'll post it or something like that. But these days I'll really just post for posting a photo's sake. And um, there is a lot of kind of, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. And so there's a lot of kind of, I don't want to say false positivity, but a lot of over uh, kind of exaggerated um, mm. positivity. And, um, and I mean, you know, lots of positivity isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it, uh, there are points where it seems forced uh, mm. for the sake of building um, collective relationships and trying to make sales. But yeah, that's I mean, it's, it's better than media. Yeah. yeah. That's I've yeah, seen that in Instagram when Instagram popularity was yeah. taking off. So it's it's it, you know it's a strategy I guess mm. to to um to fit in yeah. and and to to build those alliances and contacts and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it's it, it does look a bit yeah. fake sometimes. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, um, it, seems, it seems like the kind of medium that if if you are after using it as a financial sort of outcome, you you need to be very on top of some sort of self promotional capacity because it's it's they're not like obvious things that you can search or find online any other way um, that I'm aware of. You really you yep. really got to push it push your own wheelbarrow pretty hard to yeah or get lucky or or you know and it's sort of a it's an unusual platform and that the the essence of it is not about photography it's about you know these these huge big money players in the background that are using it as a as a as a financial tool for various other reasons and arts kind of just being mm. caught up as a as a face of it to some extent mm. is is, is yeah. what i see it but i also being an artist myself and you know, being one of the few photographers left that I know that's trying to make a living out of it full time, it's certainly something I'm mm. open to exploring. And and as much as I see the, the carbon footprint element as part of the conversation and, and it's worthy considering, it's it's relative to a lot of the other practices that are out there, I agree, that they're potentially far more um, carbon heavy in, in their use. And you can be clever about it, use different platforms. You know, like OpenSea, I think Luke, you explained to me, it doesn't really, nothing gets minted until something gets bought. So it's not actually... Influencing that realm until you actually start making some money, in which case you can also find ways to counter it. So the opposite, yeah. Mm. What what do you yeah. see as the the positive aspects of it? We talked a little about the negative, which is which is fine. Yeah. But actually, what's yeah. the inspiration? Where do you see it heading? What, what's what's great about it? Is it the future? Um, yeah. yeah, I know. I think one of the really fantastic things about it is you know ongoing artist commission. So you know in in the art, the Let's physical just kill art world, Jess, um, image because I don't know if you'd particularly like. Um, um us talking about nfts <laughs> while we're showing his <laughs> let's um let's jump over to a couple of mine that i've got um as nfts how about yeah that? how about that bit of um, promo um <laughs> oh, no, so promo I think, away. it's open platform on the show yeah. go for it i've got this one currently available um yeah i think uh one of the best things about it really is that um uh You'd like yeah, the ongoing commission to artists. Like in the physical art world, if someone sells a painting for you know three hundred bucks, and then ten years later they blow up and someone sells it for three million, they see nothing of that. They see zero commission. They don't see any sales. That all goes to the collector. Whereas with NFTs, you can set the ongoing commission. So if you know you sell something for say 0.1 Ethereum, which is about maybe six hundred bucks these days, and then um, someone buys that and then your work blows up, you get a whole lot more notoriety and reputation and someone sells that successfully for say two Ethereum, which would be maybe $9,000, you'd see 10% of that. So you get, you know, 900 bucks. So if your work increases in value in the eyes of others, then it's all that money is not just going straight to the person that previously bought your work. You're getting an ongoing um, upscaled um percentage of that which i think is really cool because it's i think it's probably the first marketplace that gives that back to artists is um that ongoing sale um commission uh is that which is, um, yeah, really fantastic is the platform set that or is that just a yeah, intrinsic a nft thing or is, you know? uh i think it depends on the platform um yeah. but there's some some have a set percentage say about 10 percent uh, other ones you can actually set the percentage yourself um so but i think the default is 10 percent. is kind of the mutually agreed on percentage that most mm -hmm. people go with um yeah so it's it's a really good thing in terms of giving you know if you do if you do it right and you sell out a collection and then people continue to you know flip those for profit which you know some people are only in it for flipping for profit which i mean also happens in the art world too in terms of the high art world it's um viewed as an asset rather than you know purely for connection to the artwork um so if people are just doing that then you're at least seeing some of the profit from that um and you know it can become a perpetual source of passive income which is a really yeah. powerful thing to have um and then really well, the positivity stories of like in terms of that passive income or that income from nfts that photographers are saying that you know with that income they don't have to run workshops or, or find other ways to make money which actually means they can spend more time taking photos right. and creating more work so it actually Absolutely. frees them yeah. up to to do what they love to do yeah yeah and it's, it's changed some people's lives for the better and which is really you know a cool thing to do like tj thorne he um was one of the first like landscape photographers to really succeed he sold out a collection of 100 um, water abstracts for half an Ethereum each and just, you know, earned him a ton of money. And, um, 
and I, like I'm in the Discord chat for um, that collection, and he was saying, you know, like he's struggled financially in the past as a landscape photographer, and this has really just freed him up um, after years of really grueling work to make his passion his living. Um, and you know, there's another guy called uh, whose kind of moniker is Drift, and he does like urban kind of photography. And um, five months ago, he was um, like in court because he was getting you know, fined for scaling buildings that he shouldn't have and stuff and um, has turned, you know, his photos into selling NFTs and been able to make a career out of that and was after, you know, only six months ago being in a really tough place in life. Um, and so I think the biggest benefit originally came, you know, to people like 3D artists and animators who don't have a physical way of selling their work. Like, you know, yeah, as cool. photographers, we have prints. We have, we you know, we can sell prints, but, you know, like, yes, animators and all that kind of stuff they can't you know they can't sell a, just a, a print of a 3d animation because it defeats the purpose but nfts allow a, a platform for people to be able to do that and mm. people are finding ways to actually physically display nfts like in these little kind of video mounted frames and light boxes and stuff like that um so i've seen yeah, recently galleries that, as well where you no know, you can yeah virtually yeah that's pretty cool yeah yeah um and so really it's just a new medium. Um, like I've, I struggled in, like I tried to make prints work for years and I've just, you know, I've made probably three sales in the last two years uh, in prints. And um, it's, it's really hard to, to dig into that niche and I've just never been able to do it. And then with NFTs, you know, I managed to, I mean, it's still relatively early and the competition blew up and really saturated the market very quickly. So it made it harder to sell within the space of about, about a month or two. But, um, you know, I managed to do better with NFTs in the space of a couple of months than I've ever done with um, prints over the last five years. So it just, it's a, it allows at least, especially photographers that may really be struggling to make photography, um, you know, their passion and how they pursue their dream. Um, NFTs has been a really good, um, yeah, kind of avenue for that as a new, um, yeah, new opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. We probably yeah. won't um, need to dwell too much more. It's not an NFT yeah. episode, but yeah, <laughs> um, it is. It is um, relevant in terms of you know the the next the generation. generation and and how they Absolutely will be is. potentially mm. selling their work and and um, you know uh, I don't think I don't see it going anywhere in terms of I, I think it will be you know it's a it'll be a, a set avenue now going forward. So um, I think yeah. it's something that. I, I, my 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 personal view is you know ignore it at your peril sort of thing um at least in terms of how it's set up um at least as a concept maybe not how it's set up now but um you can imagine if they put it on a on a you know a green blockchain rather than a you know a dirty one in terms of environmental yeah. impact then that would change it and take a lot of the um you know the naysayers out of it too so i'm sure someone's working yeah. on that already <laughs> yeah so, yeah yeah yeah, it'll be a good day once um yeah once they you know figure out a well yeah move, move ethereum especially over to that um proof of work or proof of stake or something like that format which will make it much more like, completely green yeah so, um, yeah but yeah let's, let's move um, on from that topic let's <laughs> have a look more through your portfolio ben we've probably got about another sort of you know 20 odd minutes or so or, or maybe a little yeah, bit yeah. longer um sure yeah maybe you can talk us through some of the some of the images and, and, you know, maybe um, where you got some of the inspirations from when you're creating them and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Um, so might as well start with this seascapes gallery. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so yeah, I love seascapes. Um, they're good fun. And um, I'll always enjoy shooting and getting that action with the water and stuff, because, you know, every frame is different with um, if you, you know, have that water kind of coming in. Um, this is probably my favorite, seascape of all time uh shot with luke at um lion rock mm. as the, so that was that was the morning after we got the aurora and bioluminescence mm, it, was a, it was definitely um, a special oh special what a cool period of time. i think i used up the rest my luck for the rest of the next 10 years in that 12 <laughs> hours <laughs> so um what's your uh, yeah, shutter actually, speed on that I, one ben sorry what's your shutter speed so, on that roughly i think i had about probably one third for the water as pretty default for me around between kind of one fourth and half a yeah, second. Good, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, it's just fresh on my brain. I just spent four hours shooting seascapes yesterday morning. So it's fresh in my brain, but <laughs> yeah. experimenting with different shutter speeds. But 
yeah definitely controlled just... the highlights well on that one because of you know it was mm. you know the 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 vividness of that that red in that sunrise was mm. just unreal yeah yeah um so yeah my goal with editing this one was really just to retain the luminosity and to have that sky you know um be you know you could feel the intensity of that red in the mm. sky was what the kind of the goal of the outcome for this shot and just have you know nice dark detail in these rocks here um which yeah i'm quite happy i ended up re-editing i had, my first edit for this was atrocious <laughs> so I, I came back to it a couple of months later and reprocessed and really enjoy it so this was um you can probably see the ted gore sort of style influence in this shot i feel like it's a very uh his sort of style uh frame in terms of me attempting it anyway um so uh, yeah, being quite that envious one. that you had the 14 mil um so you could just go have that yeah. bit of extra width there too which would have helped yeah oh uh, yeah yeah I was, I was very glad i rented that for the trip it was yeah. Like, <laughs> goodness yeah. me it was a good call. actually because i've got um because i've got four wide angle lion rock photos and every single one of them was at 14 mil wow um, there you go. so and like so this one this is the one i just released a tutorial video on and um yeah there was a giant rock just here and me and luke actually um shared this composition uh luke got luke i believe you got one with a sun star kind of in this that's corner right here. yeah yeah i think we yeah. um, as as photographers do we were looking up along the coastline and you know there's obviously yeah. some pretty obvious little channels i've got another shot that i yeah. released um on a, on a subsequent trip and there's definitely some great mm -hmm. little leading lines in those rock shelves so yeah, yeah. so I, I think we both came across it and then realized we both wanted to shoot it yeah <laughs> and um so I was like, yeah, you, you, you take sunset, I'll take blue hour. Yeah. Um, so we just kind of yeah, shared it in that way. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then my other line rock shot is this one here, which is actually a head on, completely head on one uh, mm. to make it look nice and tall and thin. Um, and I found this on our first morning and then came back and shot it on, during the pink sunrise the next morning. Um, so I was really stoked moving this. quick to get there while the light was still good. <laughs> yeah. That was like, just as it was dying off, um, yeah. that was kind of like the last of it. And I had, had to like, I emphasized it a little bit with my yeah. editing, but, um, yeah, brought it out a little more, but, um, it was on the back end of the, the pink colors. Mm. Um, although I had, a, <laughs> I had someone point out to me pretty quickly that it looks a little phallic in shape, which was <laughs> a little disappointing <laughs> when I realized, uh. um, but still one of my favorites i really i really love the um yeah like i like, I like that cross like stuff, composition so. yeah that to me the symbology yeah. is more in that shape than it is in phallic but... yeah yeah so I, I really enjoy that one i remember capturing it just being like yeah that's that's gonna be one of my favorites my favorite um, one and... though is um of the 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 night one mm, i'll get is that it... up now i think oh, yeah. i've got in... here we go yeah um this is probably my most yeah, not jealous um, at all one of <laughs> three <Freaking heck. laughs> so this is probably this and my image of mutant are probably my two most famous images of when i say famous is like most known yeah um so yeah this one did the rounds um last year is it um when i first posted it got shared by a couple of um uh like outlets and stuff and then uh it got included in uh, capture the atlas's uh northern lights photographer of the year article which he puts together i think 20 best photos from the last year or 20 of his favorite sort of photos of the last year showing photos of the aurora um so then and then that got published by you know bbc and stuff like that and my image was of course included so that was really cool um and yeah i was very grateful to be included in that um yeah i was, I was pretty impressed in how you put that together as well in terms of having the long exposure for the foreground and yeah, how did you put it together? Yeah, so uh, I had a, I think a three, two or three minute exposure for the foreground. To, um, I think I shot a f three point five or f four to try and get a bit more depth of field, and um, I think I maybe ISO two and a half thousand to reduce the noise slightly, and then shot about two and a half to three minute exposure to get a bit more detail in the foreground there. And it then the sky, like, it wasn't. That oh, it was very light, dark. Yeah. yeah um and then uh the sky was 25 seconds i've realized i should have done 20 seconds because there's a tiny bit of trailing in the stars at a couple of points um but yeah 25 seconds most of it was a single shot except um i got a, another frame a few minutes later that had the kind of 
let me get it up full frame that has the beams in here. Mm. So this, this uh, bioluminescence of this high pink was one shot. And then I just blended in a frame a few minutes later to get these slightly nicer textures in here. Um, yeah. The beams are hard but, to get. And, you know, if you do a longer yeah. exposure with the beams, they tend to blur into, um, yeah. you know, into it all and you don't, you lose that detail. Mm. So, yeah. 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 So um, I brought that in and um, just to, as a slight blend in there, exact same position, I uh, just a uh, slight, you know, maybe five, five sort of minute time blend just into the horizon there. And you got some zodiacal um, light going there as well. The oh yeah. Line. The astrophotography trifecta again, yeah. galaxy, um, the Milky Way, Milky Way, uh, Milky Way <laughs> galactic core, and then Aurora and zodiacal light in such and a good also position the bio, as well behind like Lion Rock. The, the and then to have the bio as well. Yeah. Is um trifecta plus bioluminescence is you know something I well, very much doubt I'll ever get again. Yeah, it's um it's pretty pretty rare to do that. <laughs> That's the unicorn sort of scenario. That I still yeah. have to work on my images. Um, yeah. I do regret working walking around and trying to get the the rock from its iconic angle or what I feel is with the aurora yeah. behind and then sort of didn't focus on that scene, but you know, live and learn, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I, I, you got quite a cool um, reflection shot from what I remember. Yeah, I need, that to, other side. I need to do more work on it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely mm. definitely plenty more to 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 have from that night. Mm. But I, I really love your storm one from the cave there. That one's oh, you yeah. got an award with that or something? Yes, this is probably my other my first kind of um, super popular shot, which um, yeah, it came first in Australia for the Nature Conservancy competition, cool. which was judged by um, Ben Good actually, Benjamin Good. Oh, nice. Um, yes, yeah, so I was yeah, I was just super stoked when that happened, and um, so I got a fair bit of exposure through that, um, which I'm out of any any photo to do well. I'm glad it was this one because it was tried quite a traumatic experience to get this shot, um, and so uh, yeah, it was really good to have um yeah something you know some you know recognition come out of you know coming away with something from that did, did you get trapped in there from the storm or something yeah this this just became a wall of rain that belted me for like 30 minutes um with like grit like blasting me and wind mm. like i had this tiny little umbrella that like was blown inside out from the wind bouncing off the back oh. of the cave into the umbrella and my gear just like ended up sitting in a pool of water and um, just this deafening, like cacophony of noise and sensory overload, um, oh and and like this lightning here wasn't like the kind of crawl across the sky lightning. It was just bang, like just mm. straight down, super aggressive. Um, and then yeah, after about thirty minutes, I got out of the cave. Made, like um, the rain slam, died down slightly, but it cave. was still intense. Yeah, just kind of <laughs> scratched myself up a bit climbing down and lost a few filter cases to the wind. And oh. and then um, I spent, there's a, another really large cave that's just on the ground. You don't need to climb up to it about a few meters to the left of this one. And so I hid in that for a while longer to wait for the lightning to die down. Um, and my Because my car was up on top of the cliff above about 100 meters away from the track that leads down to here. Um, and then I, when I thought I was like, I've, okay, I've just got to get out of here. So I ran up the top and then I was running across, you know, the exposed cliff face realizing, and then realized I was holding both a metal umbrella and an aluminum tripod, which is like two lightning conductors in my hands. Um, and so, yeah, I just sprinted across, got to my car and a lightning bolt struck the cliff top, probably about 50 meters away from where I was. It was just this Ooh. deafening crash. Um, and so I just like chucked my gear away, from, like my lightning conductors away from me. And it was just like <laughs> yelling in panic and just like shocked me into overdrive. And I was just like yelling um, and just yeah, fumbled with the keys and managed to get the door open and chucked everything inside and just sat in there, just kind of wondering how I was still alive. Um, I just was like, my hands were shaking for hours afterwards. Um, and then I also found out recently or a few months ago that um if lightning strikes the cliff top above the a cave the rock can act like a like the cave can become like a spark plug um and so and that lightning bolt i'm i'm guessing was pretty close to where the top of, like just above this cave so i don't like to i don't like to think about what would have happened if i was still in Jeez. there when that did hit so um yeah, it was a crazy yeah, experience, at least. Yeah, yeah it's um, definitely made me very cautious towards um, 
storm chasing after that. that uh, and what strikes me about this is not only obviously the amazing subject, but also um, the composition in terms of, you know, the edges of the cable being quite equidistant from the edges of the frame. So it must have mm-hmm. taken either you cropped it really well or took a long, long time, you know, measuring up millimeters mm-hmm. of where the camera was pointed. Yeah, I just, uh, I, could, like, I think this was, I was shooting on my Nikon D5200 at the time, so just my old entry level camera and Tekina 11 to 16 mil lens. So this was just like as wide as I could possibly go. Um, and so, yeah, I think I just framed it up as best as I could to make sure it was all nicely um, well balanced and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I'm really proud of the shot and very happy I came away with something after. You know, it'd be, it it would have sucked to um, you know, go through that and come away with nothing. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. fair enough. Yeah, I've got another one from there that doesn't really. It doesn't really get the light of day anymore. But this one here, um, so that was earlier in the mm. afternoon. Um, so I couldn't quite get wide enough, unfortunately, to have the um, these inside the frame, which bugs me. But um. This was a, a blend of a few different bolts. And then there was actually, you know, this slight bit of sun poking through here, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the other one's definitely a stronger shot. Yeah. Awesome. So you can you can just see how aggressive that lightning is just coming yeah. straight down, just no crawling across the sky or anything like that. Um, Must have been, yeah, yeah, amazing being there. Yeah. But how did yeah, you learn, learn your blending skills? um just post-processing videos and tutorials really um like i I learned a while just from free youtube stuff like jimmy mcintyre back in the day um he had free like just youtube stuff that that taught exposure blending and all that kind of stuff um focus stacking i think i just read articles about and then uh in terms of you know creative post-processing i learned once i started purchasing um yeah, tutorial instruction videos from photographers that I admired. Um, Ted Gore being the first guy that I bought from has just really, um, yeah, revolutionized my my own processing um, and helped me, yeah, be where I am today with that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just always trying to um, advance in my own uh, editing skills because I think these days with digital photography is half the process, especially in gaining a unique look. Um, and having like a really polished and refined final result so yeah a lot of care and care and attention goes into my um my processing i was uh i was planning on waking up with that little shot as this morning <laughs> leafy bay oh yeah oh uh, yeah that, that labyrinth this shot. one here oh yeah uh oh yeah so that was um we got a hailstorm luke i believe that afternoon we were just crashed yeah, into a shelter got pelted yeah um, and then I think you actually lent me your polarizer for this, which is how I managed to get these nice oh. colors in here, which I was very, because I remember I cracked my polarizer when I was down there. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. You weren't happy yeah. about that. <laughs> no, I was, <laughs> that was, it. That was, I was the, very um, bad at, rainbow yeah. one was the same. Was it the same day? I think it was, or the, uh, it was actually, yeah. yeah it was later that afternoon. Yeah. It was a pretty, um, so I don't often get that many storms coming through, um, Tassie. So it was, yeah. it was quite a, quite awesome I got another awesome one. day and then that's later that night as well yeah yeah that's another one there um oh nice and pretty yeah, how wide, how wide is that one is that 14 as well that one's pretty wide which one the hazards one you just opened this one here yeah uh i think that's 16 millimeters yeah pretty wide yeah I um I did I wasn't using my 14 mil at the time because I wanted um that polarizer to cut through to this really nice lichen color. Yeah. Um so yeah, I deliberately opted for the 16 mil. Um yeah, because I, I brought a 16 mil and a 14 mil with me on that trip <laughs> so I could uh because I didn't have a polarizer for the 14 millimeter. Um but your 16 and, was also F4, wasn't it? Not 2.8. Yeah, it was F yeah, yeah F4. Yeah. yeah. So it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, I've got some forest and falls in here as well. Yeah. Um, yeah you said you're a fan and, of the mossy forest. I remember seeing you when, when we're in the tar yeah. and frothing pretty hard on <laughs> some of the trees. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, which one's the tar Let me Let me get it up. 
this one here. I think that was, yeah, that was with you in um, that talk on rainforest in the last evening or morning once it comes up. Just, yeah, really nice moss. Yep. Yeah, it was magic yeah. there. Um, and then this was up north last year. That's This is one of my favourite photos. Um, yeah, I love that. Just, yeah, yeah the, oh, wow. the mossy the mossy draping trees is something I really, really enjoy. Um, and, like, when I when I was taking this photo, I think I spent about 90 minutes of this waterfall just fine-tuning my composition and waiting for the light to get a bit lower. Um, filled up my water bottle at that pool over there, drank it with no issue, <laughs> didn't need a filter. Mm. Um, yeah, I yeah, love the forest, love trees. Yeah, it's a, it's an you know, you always well, it's a, feel it's a love hate for many people to simplify such a complex environment um, compositionally mm. is a, quite a challenge, I find. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very difficult. Um, Nick's a bit of a master, and Nick, our co host, um, he's very good at the forest shots, mm. but something I'm always very yeah. envious of because I, I just lose my mind when I see all the chaos that's in there <laughs> and trying to make sense of it. it's very challenging. So guess you hone your yeah, eye over yeah. a period of time mm. yeah i love nick's um talk around rainforest shots there they're really really lovely um yeah, yeah. And, like they're difficult to process as well like this one here um like the, the entire week i was up there i just got these like dry windy conditions there was no fog there's no moisture or anything like that so i struggled I, I had to use direct light a fair bit um so this is probably one of my most liberal processing um that i've done in my portfolio because these beans weren't present in the original shot yeah um and i just I, I added them in because it was actually you know the sun was just in there and then there was direct light hitting these leaves yep. so it made sense you know light wise for that to be there if there was you know mist or fog present um and it just i felt it tied it together pretty well but mm. usually that's not a step in terms of adding an element of light like that, it's not a step I'd usually take. A bit of a um, bit of, I can see a bit of maybe in a Fasati, um, in, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe slash with yeah. a, maybe some Ted Gore in got, that um, one. Yeah, yeah, it's I've actually got the before and after here. Um, yeah, I saw you posting about the before and after, I was really enjoying those. This one here, actually, so that's the that's the raw file, it's very blocked out shadows and harsh light. Um, and then that's the after. Mm. Um, so yeah, just I I, I wow. found that I really liked the composition, but the light was just really difficult to work with. So rather than you know make the seven hour trip back up in hopes of <laughs> um, more fog, I just was like I'll just make something out of nothing here. Um, so yeah, it's not, you, it's not um, the extent. How do you feel about that in terms of do you, do you get just as much satisfaction when you will create something like that or not create it, but, you know, accentuate it or like I mean, is, is your preference always to get it in camera or, you know, it doesn't bother yeah. you either way what the end result is the end result? Yeah, I think, you know, my, my goal is always to create the best image from what I've captured um, and I always prefer to capture that in camera because I think that's just part of the fun and enjoyment of landscape photography is showcasing, you know, things that have happened. Like there's not a shot in my portfolio where I've dropped in a sky because I don't want to represent that being my experience if it wasn't my experience, you know? Um, mm. And so, uh, but yeah, but that being said, I'm probably a little bit more liberal than others in my processing in terms of, um, maybe accentuating the light that was there because if it's, you know, if I was presented with a bit of a dud, then, you know, I'll, I'll enhance that dud to be a little bit better, especially if I don't have the chance to revisit. If I have the, if I can revisit a spot, then I'll just, you know, I'll keep going back until I get it right. But if it's a spot that's international or many, many, many hours away and I can't just easily get back for perfect conditions, then that's when I'll polish a turd, so to speak, a little bit more and um, maybe uh, take the edit a little bit further than um, what I would to just have the, the best final result in terms of what, um, you know, and my, my processing is very organic. I'm not, I um, sometimes I'll have a very pre-envisioned uh, sort of approach and I'll know exactly where I want to take it. Um, but most of the time I'll kind of have a rough idea and then just as, you know, I see an adjustment that I want to make and think, oh, this could work. This could help tie things together. Then I'll just add it. Um, and so, so in like this case. Many, many layers then. Oh, yeah. I'm regularly <laughs> saving as a PSB instead of PSD because it's exceeded <laughs> the two gig file limit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
And so, yeah, these beams here were the fi- like almost one of the last steps I took because I tried editing the image, you know, without them, you know, for quite a, like about several days, I um, was trying to make it work. And I just kept on being like, ah, oh, like I, I just came, kind of came to the point was like, this would just tie the image together. Um, and after, you know, trying to make it work without, it's just what naturally happened in the creative process. And, um, you know, I really enjoy post-processing as part of, you know, my, you know, way of satisfying my inner creativity. Um, some people, you know, are much more purist in their photography, which is, you know, I totally get, and it's part of, you know, their art form. But I think that as long as you're, um, honest and not deceitful in your practices and you're not claiming that, uh, and it, that a photo that you photoshopped was your, your actual experience, then mm. I think you can, you know, be as liberal as you want. Um, I do take issue when, you know, people say, oh yeah, this is a storm that rolled in over this incredible mountain scene, but really it was a bluebird sky and, or just overcast day and they completely photoshopped the scene mm. in. Yeah. That's, and in this um, case, you know, you, false the light- people to believe that. Yeah. In this case, the light was there too. Um, yeah. Like if people, the angles, you know, angles all, all the same. You yeah. Know, you have, yeah. 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 Sure. And so, yeah, I'm, um, I'm all, all, all for, um, you know, other people being really liberal in their creativity, just as long as they're not, um, doing it via deceit to get more attention for their shots. Um, and, you know, being open about the creative process. Um, so yeah. That's that's kind of my two cents about it. Yeah, I think that's a fair fair assessment, a fair approach. Um, yeah. Yeah. So very, it's very um, reliant on people's um, people not telling white lies or porky pies, which um, you know is yeah. is, is um, I guess when people get caught out, it can be quite embarrassing. So um, that's that's yeah. always the risk people run when they do those sort of things. Yeah. Maybe um, we were just um, looking at a few extra um, or a few of the more up and coming inspirations um, and we, we yeah. I don't think we went through all of them. Um, maybe we could just yeah. Um, yeah. finish off with a few of those. Yeah. So uh, Heisu Chung is another um, Sydney guy that's, you know, really, it just gets out there so much. Uh, like he shoots a lot and um, does a very the, distinct sort of style. the night to day stuff as well he does? Is that right? Yeah, he does yeah. this just crazy, like pulling, pulls an all nighter to get this like sunset light, star trail and sunrise light and then blends them into this crazy, like um, surrealistic sort of look. And it's very unique. And like, he's the only person that I know that's doing that. And um, only person crazy yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just uh, like he, he's um, described the experience of doing it on um, like one of his posts before. And he just like says he sets an alarm for like every 20 minutes and just gets into this like meditative, almost hallucinogenic state when you're that tired and staying up for an entire night shooting star trails um, as crazy dedication. Um, and I really wow. respect it. Um, and so, yeah, he's just got this, I, I believe he's uh, from what I've chatted to him before, I've shot with him a couple of times. Um, I believe he's, uh, inspired by like Max Brive and stuff. I think he's um, had some of his editing tutorials um, and you can kind of, you know, especially in his waterfall work and stuff, you can kind of see that coming through. Yeah, but um, yeah. It does some really good astro work. I, rem- I can remember. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, it just is one of the most proactive shooters in Sydney from um, yeah. He's just constantly, you know, just chasing conditions and um, getting out there and pushing himself. So um you know he's teaching nikon classes these days which is really cool um and yeah he's just really dedicated guy he's got his very you know he's got his niche he's found his style and um though it's you know it's not quite you know the style that um i shoot in or take my images but it's i still really respect it and um yeah he's just you can tell he's just really passionate about it and Mm -hmm. um like refining his skill i love this shot this one's um the, the composition here and it's just really cool um it's a little big for the screen but um yeah that foreground there's fantastic yeah yeah the um, lead in oh, there wow. yeah mm. it's, is that, yeah. That, that looks like it's around that boy's head area um, potentially or i oh, know it's um Mount solitary i think it, it might be more yeah it's mount solitary in the background yeah. so I, it looks like it'd be more um towards castle rock or something yeah. like that but um yeah that's fantastic shot and you, like that's not a composition that I've seen anyone else shoot mm. except for maybe unless Gary Hayes has one buried in his website somewhere. But 
Um, just lots Gary's of exploring. Gary's covered and, every square centimeter of the blue. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, you just you can just tell he gets out a lot and explores heaps and um, yeah, just has heaps of drive towards it. So um, looking forward to where his career goes in the next over the next few years. Mm. Um, do, you, do you know if he's trying to do it full time or is he just um, you know just you know weekend warrior sort of thing? I'm not sure if he's trying to do it full time. I know his um his day job's a parkour instructor, which is pretty cool. Oh wow, cool! Um, oh, works no at a par- yeah, works at a parkour gym, oh. which is pretty like one of the coolest day jobs you could possibly have. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't really know if um you know his goal is to do this full time, but he's definitely you know he's making part time money with, from it. With um, it sounds like know, he's got an adaptable job for it um, anyway. Often with those sort of things, yeah, you can choose hours a bit easier, and especially if you're going yeah. to do all nighters, you're not going to be too functional at work the next day. So yeah, especially high energy stuff like <laughs> parkour. Yeah, that's so, right. You don't want to muck that one up. You'd end up yeah, yeah. bad things can happen. <laughs> end yeah. up part of the pavement. But... <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, he's got some really great. This Who else styles. did we have up there? Him out. We got, is that Michael um, Kenny there? So I've got, uh, yeah, Michael Kenny. So yeah. me and Michael are good mates. Um, and he's, uh, yeah, so over the last year or two, is um, just really, uh, just started really working on his technique and um, he's developing his eye, which has been really, really cool to see. Um, started moving into intimates as well, which is cool. Love that one um, with the, he yeah, did the, the flowers labyrinth. in the foreground there. Um, Looks like you're in for it. Yeah, yeah, crescent. That's um, crescent head, I believe. Yep. Um, and but except from the um, actually on the crescent head cliff, but shooting yep. back towards the other one. So you, that's the sea cave over there. With the oh, big right. Structure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I love this composition. It's really sick uh, foreground, yep. and um, he repro- reprocessed this one as well, and it's really nice and soft um, sort of tones. So. Yeah, it's probably one of my favorite shots of his actually. So it's interesting. You know, um, I, we were talking earlier about Lion Rock, and then last time, like I went there two times ago. Well, it's actually a few times ago with, with you. And then the next time I was there, um, there was this other guy taking photos and got talking, and it, it was yeah. Michael. And um, yeah, and um, he was he went there because you recommended. Oh, is that how I met as well? Luke? Um, sorry, yeah, is that how I met? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you were there too, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah. come full circle. Yeah, Michael was telling me about that actually. He was um, saying like he was just shooting at Lion Rock, and then it's like, and then Luke and Paul rocked up. <laughs> so it was uh, he was said it was very unexpected. So, um, yeah, it's cool kind of crossover there. Um, yeah, yeah, I love it. that light. That look, it looks like you got some fantastic light there. That um, that shot yeah. of the Warren Bungles there with um Castle, um, what's it called? Uh, Which one is it? Something Bluff, uh, Crater Bluff. Um, looks um, like he shot it through a cave or something. It's quite a unique. Oh concept. yeah, let me. Um, I'm just trying to find it on the page. I just saw it a bit it? earlier, and um, might be. Uh, here we go. Yeah, this one. Yeah, that's right. I've never seen a like. Yeah. It just shows um a bit of ingenuity because you know I've never seen that composition before. So you know yeah. when you mm. when you see something a bit different and unique yeah. like that, um, it, it shows that he's really trying to mm. to find his own unique angles, which I always respect a lot. Um, certainly, yeah. how I, I like to approach things as well. Yeah, um, this is a newer one of his. It's probably one of my favorites actually. This is up mm. at Stockton Sand Dunes, and just the. The textures and lights, fantastic. I love. You can tell it's a more compressed focal length as well to get, mm. you know, um, that June in the background to not be tiny. Um, so it's probably, I'm guessing, around 35 sort of mil, 50 mil maybe. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to just not automatically go to wide angle. Um, mm. And yeah, have this yeah really cool texture and this subtle kind of leading line coming in here. And leading lines are so much harder to do when you're at a compressed angle. So that's a um, very that's considered way. composition. The, the yeah. S bend leading in from the corner and then the, that, mm. that little shelf thingy, um, the foreground kind of very equidistant from yeah. the, both sides. It's um, yeah, he's mm. definitely put a lot of thought into that. Yeah. It's a fantastic shot. Um, yeah. So yeah, he's got some great work and um, him and I are going to Tassie together and Luke, I believe you might be joining us as well. Well, I mean, I'm I probably think. crashing the party. I can't, I can't handle you guys being oh, no, we're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd, we'd, we'd absolutely love to have you along. Oh yeah, um, that sounds good. Hopefully, you can make yeah, it. Yeah, so. fingers crossed. Oh yeah, fingers crossed. I, I mean, we're both vaccinated now, and um, you know, I, I feel like 
by Christmas. Hopefully, the states will open up for the sake of their economies. So I have I'm been, sure the they have been making noise about before Christmas. So um, okay. I, I have heard recently, but then you know that there's mm. a you know they want to get certain targets and things down here. So it's yeah. going to be yeah, it'll be interesting. Touch and go. Yeah. Out. yeah, yeah. So fingers crossed there. Um, uh, Sam Markham is another guy that's been going uh, mm. pretty hard at it for a while. Uh, so um, he's got some great shots in here. I think um, he's, he did a Will Patino workshop or a couple of them a few weeks, a few years ago. And you can see that inspiration kind of. Definitely um, with that shot there with the. Um, yeah, with quite the, similar with to one of Will's. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, um, yeah. I think he did quite well in um, Osgeo. Um, nature photographer this year i think he, he got a short yeah. listing or something like that Remember? yeah i think he had um one of his fire like the bushfire photos i think did yeah. quite well maybe um yeah it looks like he's yeah he got this really cool um, as well yeah got some nice forest work in here uh, i think this is ash this shot here which is really sick um one yeah. of the yeah that, that's it there yeah, that's really beautifully done. Um, isn't it? So that was a really creative shot from the from the yeah from the bushfires, um, and I think he, he made it over to Patagonia um, a couple of years ago too with DK photography. Oh yeah, um, wow. And yeah, so he's got some Patagonia shots. Uh, this is probably my favorite photo of his. It's like a vertical panorama um, up in oh, the, the castle. castle of the, the yeah. Budawangs, and yeah. I, I reckon this is the best shot of the Budawangs that oh. I've seen. I love this mm. shot. Um, just a fantastic, you know, kind of foreground. You've got just the perfect amount of separation between that there leading to that and just really good drama. Um, yeah, it's um, so yeah, yeah. absolutely stunning. To it's a very, oh. very, um, well, it's mm. not, it, it's it's a reasonable walk to get in there. It's quite, a, you know, you have to go up ropes and things like that. So yeah. it shows a fair bit of commitment too to, to get himself mm. into a place like that. So mm. um, it, you, you can often tell when you know what's involved to get there um, how serious someone is. <laughs> as yeah. well and that, that takes commitment yeah. so absolutely and even just you know doing a vertical panorama composition is really difficult to do and it, mm. it's, it's so well balanced here so one um, that I yeah kudos struck to me, him um, on the list uh, of that you know the, out of all of the images there was um there was, looked like there was an astro one um uh, in in the kimberley or i think it's in the this button, one here a bit further down yeah that one's pretty nice there's another one a bit further down too okay, um get that up uh, yeah, that one there, the the cave one. Uh, it's a bit f the dawn of. Oh, this one here. Yeah. Yeah. That one looks pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that I think that was like, on another uh, Utah workshop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does Panalulu. actually. Yeah. I tried to do that walk. I remember, mm. um, and it was like freaking forty degrees, and I was with a friend who was right on the edge of not having enough time to do it, and. Oh, always regretted it. Mm. Incredible place to work. Um, yeah, so that's that's Sam. Um, yep. Who's Michael McGee? I was just um, as an, one kind of last guy. Michael McGee is um, a guy over in New Zealand and just has these really fantastic forest shots, and um, is also fantastic with like abstracts and intimates as well with okay. uh, rocks and water. Um, and he does this kind of mini collections, which are really cool. Like he did this one called Primordial Soup, <laughs> which was just like a froth um, kind of swirls in water. <clears throat> oh. me. But yeah, just really cool explorations of textures. And um, it's got the fantastic New Zealand rainforest as well. Um, I have think he's based in the a, North Island. Have you come across a guy called Ryan North at all? His name rings a bell. I'm yeah, sure he's, he's got. I'm sure, I follow really, him on Instagram. Yeah, he, uh, he's got some really, really great little um, uh, some in, uh, abstract work and that kind of thing. So yeah, definitely worth a look. Yeah, like this one of Michael's is just fantastic. Once it loads, um, just the atmosphere in there, it's wow. just really solid, yeah. and just the yeah, the crazy mossy trees are fantastic. Um, and those some, yeah, so those he, some, he's some got good really push there. Work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very um, um subtle color too. It hasn't really pushed the saturation or anything, has he? It's, it, it's yeah, which tastefully is tastefully done. Yeah, really refreshing. He's got these crazy um 
like water bubble abstracts as well. I think oh. you got these at, at the base of like a waterfall or something um, <clears throat> where there was heaps of like just turbulence in the water. And uh, so, yeah, he's just really creative with his, um, with his like work. Eggs. Yeah. It's a bit um, um, TJ Thorn perhaps influenced or, or that, that similar sort of yeah. thing in terms of the very um specific abstracts um but also mm. yeah with sort of th- theme with the themes behind them as well yeah yeah i definitely see tj thorn influence um this is another i think you've got some, like these are beams within this rainforest like this shot right here oh wow just crazy wow um yeah there's like a rainbow within like a fog bow within these beams here just yeah insane conditions yeah so you know that's um, not probably put in it'd be pretty hard to make that up yeah yeah and you know just with his processing style you know that you know he's not faking these they're they're legit wow. um this one here this more kind of layers version of it um mm. yeah so yeah he's just got some really great subtle uh, and unique work as well. Like it's not, you know, a composition that you'd have fi- found before that other people's yeah. other people would have. Definitely makes you want to know more, doesn't yeah. it? It's always really refreshing to see when it's, yeah, um, because you know, there's a point where um, the competition for better skies at the same composition that someone else has taken gets a bit tiring um, <laughs> just kind of the instagram culture it's like someone finds a composition and then someone moves in and shoots it with a better sky and then someone else moves in and shoots it with a better sky and then someone shoots an astro and it's just um like oh, i've got to top the other person kind of thing um well you've definitely got a few and- shots like that in your portfolio that make me feel like that like the one at the <laughs> tour with the with the Ast- i've always wanted to have an astro night like the night you had there never never managed to get that so oh, um uh, the uh, with it kind of like coming out of the the top of yes um, yes let me get it yes. up oh yeah yeah this a lot of people here. pouring after that as well oh yeah there's uh, yeah yeah this that's one the here. one yeah that's definitely it yeah. yeah and you've got some amazing air glow there as well yeah. oh yeah it was crazy um just yeah this red um this is a another one that I got a few minutes uh, about twenty minutes later um. Mm same same night and i was just yeah you know, freezing my toes off it looks so off cold up there man. it was freezing it was oh, the one coldest the left as well. yeah that was the next morning too oh right okay interesting yeah so, something came in overnight and it does clear pretty yeah, quickly spend two days thawing out after that combo shoot oh <laughs> uh, yeah uh so this was actually about 11 a.m so we had clear skies for hours um and then we were we We'd all packed up our tents and we were about to hike down and then this whiteout came through and we just madly unpacked our cameras and I shot this handheld and a whole bunch of other ones handheld just for a while because it was, um, yeah, just came out of nowhere and created this amazing atmosphere, um, which was really cool. And then I also got this one. Yeah. And then this one was the night before too, um, looking back the other way, kind of 180 degrees behind the tour. Um, and because it's done been, well to hide it, you, cover your tracks and not not walk through the you know the the snow and you know the footprints ruining the shot sort of thing. A funny thing that actually uh, there was um tracks all through here because uh, <laughs> that was actually our pathway to get around. <laughs> um, and so what I had to do actually was take the foreground kind of ice from a similar composition that didn't have tracks through it because I liked this rock better. Um, and so I I um edited in the foreground for this part and replaced it here to get rid of the tracks because I tried gloating out the tracks and it just, it was a mess. It didn't look good. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I, I'd taken a similar, very similar composition with a different foreground rock and had these ice textures in there instead. And so I just replaced it um, oh. and did a tiny little warp to make it fit the the shape of it. Well, done a great um, job. We wouldn't know. So yeah. It's, yeah, it's quite a tricky blend, but managed to make it work. Um, so yeah, that was another really good kind of two day trip that I had back in 2019. So um, yeah, I was with Maddie Hopkins and um, Ryan McCarthy and Ray Chow, who are all also you know fantastic yes, photographers that, as well. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah. So um, cool. Yeah, got got lucky multiple times. Do you have <laughs> yeah, a, so. a final image or two you'd like to share, or or um something to finish on? I know that you also do. You have a lot of um you know post processing tutorials and stuff. Maybe you want to tell us about that before we sign off. 
Um, yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, we could so, just finish up with where where people can best enjoy your work outside of the site here, and and what you mm. sort of offer, and maybe a little bit about the the future of where you see yourself heading as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes, yeah, so my website uh, benmaysfineart.com is where you can find just about everything. Um, it's got links to my socials um, and all my galleries, all my services, products. Um, uh, I've released a newsletter recently as well. So if you want, you know, direct updates and stuff, as well as exclusive discounts and early product releases and all of that, um, you can sign up to that. I'm trying to do it, you know, maximum once a month, so I'm not spamming. Um, and yeah, so I've got prints. I also sell puzzles via um, Jigsaw Gallery, which is something yeah, I started great. doing in the last few months, um, which has been good. Uh, and um, yeah, I've got a Blue Mountains workshop coming up next year in the in April, which I'm really looking forward to. Got a couple of participants locked in so far, and I'm guessing once things open back up, um, people are a bit more confident to travel and stuff, then I'm hoping I'll get a few more people in on that. Um, so yeah, that'll be five days in the Blue Mountains, which I'm really looking forward to, um, especially as it's a place that you know, is close to my heart growing up there with my grandparents um, over the last kind of decade. Um, released my first video tutorial recently, which is um, kind of, yeah, two hours of uh, start to finish content, taking my photo from this to this with a whole lot of different techniques like um, yeah, focus stacking and time blending and exposure blending, perspective blending and creating a dreamy sort of atmosphere with processing. Um, so, yeah, that's available at the moment now, um, as well as, you know, private editing instruction and portfolio critique sessions. Um, but yeah, it's just, I've got my, all my galleries here. Um, you can find me on Instagram at benjamin.mays, um, and Twitter that if you just search Benjamin Mays, you should be able to find me Facebook, Ben Mays photography. Um, but yeah, you've got if, those links down the bottom there too, don't you? So they can just, yeah, just on my website. Yeah. So website's probably the best all in one place to find everything about me. Awesome. Well, um, look, thanks so much for your time, mate. And, um, thanks for showing us, Oh, you, you know your amazing work and then your inspirations and and some of the other um sort of peers and other you know photographers that you admire it's um really great to to have that insight and and um one thing i was talking to paul actually a bit earlier was that we don't probably do enough talking about um just other great work in general that's out there and um you know so so it's really nice to be able to to talk about that and maybe share some photography. Yeah, we, we had a good chat about that this afternoon about even getting a panel together to just talk purely just about that. About inspiration yeah. and and you know what yeah what we're you know what pe you what know, influences what, the way we see and, and mm. what we draw to capture and, and present. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so good. hopefully that's something that we can tee up um, in the not too distant future. Um, uh, when I was about your age, I I think I was just picking up my first um, point and shoot zoom camera mate so, so it's I'm a little bit blown away by where, where you're at at your age yeah it's pretty a impressive bloomer, so um i hadn't hats, even started hats off shooting. To you, ben. still got um six or seven yeah. years before yeah, i started you. on that so yeah very very good so very bright future ahead of you mate just um keep your head down and keep the passion alive that's the i think that's the critical thing just gotta you know keep um keep frothing on it <laughs> Yeah, really, yeah. really deeply appreciate how how open and supportive you are of other people's work and how honest uh, your influences are and the transparency in your work processes. There's a lot of integrity there, Ben, and, and a lot of um, the right kind of spirit of, of the community that uh, that spells a lot for the longevity and also the kind of commitment that's gone into your photography really speaks for itself. And I think more so to the viewers that hear some of the stories behind it. Mm. Uh, being experienced walkers and done stuff ourselves, we can kind of see behind some of the um, areas and, and know what it takes to get there, but which of you is don't necessarily uh, have. But uh, I love the lightning story of the cave. That was pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, my yeah, God. One thing, um, one yeah. thing that's <laughs> worth, well worth doing is following Ben on Instagram and, and checking out mm. his stories because he very, very well, almost daily um, shares his inspirations on there or any other great work he comes across. And, and, you know, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I've found a lot of great photographers through that. So the number of photographers and, and people you must be following and keeping track of is, is, is huge. So, um, you know, kudos yeah. for even keeping up with that. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's really, I've, I've really enjoyed that um, myself. So keep up the mm. good work with that. 
Um, do we have any? Did you have anything that you wanted to add, Paul, um, before we sign off? No, I'm, I may be on a boat somewhere and, and on the Great Barrier Reef next week. So you might not hear from me. <laughs> yes, yes, we're um, still trying to sort out the show next week, but it's most likely going to be about Cradle Mountain and the high country in Tasmania, which is obviously a very popular area probably talking a bit about the overland track um, and um, yeah, the entire Cradle Mountain Lakes at Clare National Park, as well as um, Walls of Jerusalem and other high country areas in, in Tassie, which is probably some of the gems of the whole place. So we're really looking forward to talking about that. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm, I think that's probably all for tonight. So thanks very much again, Ben, for joining us. Um, hopefully not the last time. And um, uh, not at all. I hope we get yeah. to shit together soon, Ben. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, yeah thanks everyone for too. joining us. Um, and we'll see you again same time next week. See you. <laughs>